Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Steven Zuber. I'm Jay Sticky. Hey, welcome back, Jace. We missed you last week. Yeah, I saw that you did another one about children, and I was yeah. listening to it, and I was just like, oh man, we've done so many things about children. Like, I wonder if our audience is tired of it, and then I'm listening to it, and I'm like, oh no, I have opinions. I really <laughs> shouldn't bring them up again, because it'll just keep going. Yeah. At, at some point, <laughs> I've, I've had that situation happen with more than one topic, where at some point you're just like, you know what? I'm not changing anyone's mind anymore. I've just got to step away for a little while. <laughs> Then you can just come back to it in like six months. Then it's like kind of fresh again. But yeah, if we kept going on with it, then all the people who were children when we started that subject would have been <laughs> fully adults by the time we were done with it. So yes. Well, then we can check our uh, intuitions. So how was it? Yeah, exactly. We could. We can. How, how was the parenting or whatever? Yeah. We'll, we'll <laughs> so we're our... just going to keep this going for many, many years. Yeah, a few decades. Not a big deal. Yeah. What we really need is people who are listeners right now to have children, introduce their children to the podcast, and like do the whole 20 year cycle and then come back and ask those children how it went. Not Preferably have volunteers. twins and only give half of them the podcast. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes. But yeah, no, this is not a voluntary thing. They will be conscripted into the study. <laughs> Oh. Spe- speaking of missing you guys, we're doing this in remote because it's been a long weekend and the commute is rough. And I'm, I pushed for. Can I sit at home, please, and save the 80-minute round trip? So yeah. if anyone enjoys the latency of, of remote recording, that's what's going on. Also, thank you very much for making that trip every other week. It's, oh, it's great. I know. It's a, it's a, it's a haul. No, I mean, you know, it, I, I, whenever we go anywhere on the weekends, I, my wife always offers to drive, but she drives to work, and I don't leave the house. So, like, I'm happy to get out and use my car. But yesterday we went to Fort Collins, then Colorado Springs, which ended up to being, like, 260 miles but that's yeah. not that's not that bad if you're just going, you know, it's just up and down I-25, so. Yeah, but you went from Denver north to Fort Collins, then back through Denver, then down to Colorado Springs, then up to Denver again. Meh. <laughs> it's just got to be frustrating. Yeah, it was, it was totally worth it both times. You're like, so. if, the, if these two cities averaged their location from Denver, they'd be right <laughs> here, and I wouldn't have to go anywhere. If, if either of the trips were for, you know, if they were like a drag, then that would have been a bummer. But no, it was uh, visiting family in Fort Collins, and then uh, our first, like, I don't know. Uh, well, my first, um, we have a friend of the show, Zeke Aran has been on before. He'll host like semi-annual parties and, uh, this is first one. Always. Yeah. First one in a couple of years. So it was great. Ooh. Should we post the, pic- the pictures of the costumes we were in for the Patreons? Yeah. I'd be into it. Yeah. Jace, you took one of, uh, me and Rachel. I think that'd be fun. Yeah. Your costume was the best. I think. <laughs> I disagree. Does it, we have to have a picture of you somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, Zeke posted one on Facebook. Oh, good. Okay, cool. Because yeah. I didn't get yeah, your costume was myself. Awesome. Yeah, it's not my costume. It's just like random shit that I had in my closet that I that's, used to just wear. Like I this mean, is how I normally dress, or how I used to normally dress when I was cool. awesome. You were always a wastelander. Yeah, you looked straight out of Borderlands. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. That's what I was going for. Except I think I was going for Mad Max Two because that was the actual theme. It's kind of a loose theme. I never saw the original Mad Max movies. The Oh, none of them? None of them. Like, the very first one is very different from the others, and, I mean, kind of not recommended if what you're going for is the classic Mad Max feel. But, uh, yeah, Beyond Thunderdome is just great. And The Road Warrior is pretty good, too, in the whole, you know, cheesy 80s uh, action movie with lots of great car chases way. Like, it's it's <laughs> worth watching. No, that, I'm a weirdo. Kind of right I, enjoy, I enjoy all of them, but they are definitely different experiences. Yeah. It took them a but, while I mean, to sort of find their thing. Yeah, and you, you saw Fury Road, so it's it's a lot like Fury Road, except with far lower budget because yeah. you know they didn't have the brand yet. It was just some guys in Australia, or, or uh, the tech it's still some guys in Australia. <laughs> well, yes, but but with a lot more money this time. But it with was still money. yeah, but it was still really well done. Like tons of practical effects of cars flipping and shit. It was. I don't even want to know how many stunt people's lives they put at risk doing that. Well, you know, I think that's I, uh, just what people are doing in Australia all the time anyway. <laughs> that's my headcanon. Don't prove yeah. me wrong. I don't want to know if it's not like that. They were like, you know what? Let's go out and film our friends doing this next weekend. We can make a movie out of it. <laughs> there wasn't much of a plot to the first one. It could have just been some guys hanging out in Australia. It's just your average Tuesday. Okay, so uh, let's get on to the actual podcast, which always starts with the less wrong posts. Almost always, not every time. Uh, I don't want to be technically incorrect, because that's the worst kind of incorrect. <laughs> uh, I kind this of like when you just like, strongly assert, as always, which we yes. never deviate from. Anyway, uh, we're, we're not once. About. 
Uh, the the post this week is fake justification is the first one. I didn't pull out very much from this one. Maybe I, so I was thinking maybe I just read the one thing I did pull out and you guys can talk more about things that you thought or pulled out or whatever. Yeah, sure. Okay. Basically, fake justification is um, yelling at clouds, uh, telling people not to uh, say that they have justified something when they didn't actually really justify it at all. They already had a preconceived notion, very similar to writing the bottom line that we talked about a few months ago. The quote I pulled out was, many Christians who've stopped really believing now insist that they revere the Bible as a source of ethical advice. The standard atheist replies given by Sam Harris, you and I both know that it would take us five minutes to produce a book that offers a more coherent and compassionate morality than the Bible does. <laughs> Similarly, one may try to insist that the Bible is valuable as a literary work, then why not revere Lord of the Rings, a vastly superior literary work? Um, and that, that was basically his example of, you know, people are trying to justify why they still like the Bible with all this other stuff. Like it's, it's got ethical frameworks or it's got good literary value. And that's obviously not their real justification because when you examine it for even five minutes, you're like, this is complete bullshit. I have to say, I think it's a fascinating anthropological book. I wouldn't say yes. that it's a very good piece of literature. No. In fact, it's a really boring and sometimes completely baffling piece of literature i tried to read <laughs> yeah. or i didn't try to i did in fact read the entire thing and then all the uh dead sea scrolls the, the really regular. well um i took a bible as literature class and as part of my literature track in college oh, but cool. i like it was a requirement but also i was kind of psyched to do it because that was during sort of the beginning of the new atheist period for me and i was like i've never actually read the bible cover to cover i'm gonna like really give it a fair shake and see if it convinces me. What if I read this and it convinces me? Maybe there's some really awesome gems of wisdom, some nuggets that I haven't just been able to pick up now. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm there was a lot of there was a lot of animal sacrifice. Yes. <laughs> I'm frequently surprised names. by like as as someone who in the Jehovah's Witness religion they regularly re, re, regularly read large parts of the Bible and like I just assumed everyone had some background Bible knowledge. So I was for a long time frequently surprised by people who read the Bible for the first time and saw like how kind of dumb and hokey it was. And I'm like, you, how did you not know this? It's your holy book or it's the holy book of the culture you've been raised in for 20 years. And they're like, I don't know. I just assumed it was profound and well-written. And I'm like, okay, that is read some of it. I think that is still a remarkably common thing. And, and some people will, you know, like they can cite passages or something and say, yeah, that, you know, and there, there are, there are gems to be found for sure, mm -hmm. but you've got to dig through a mountain of foreskins to find them. And <laughs> it's like, again, like, like Harris in the Harris quote, you know, we could offer a more comprehensive and succinct uh, morality if that's what you're looking for. But I guess if I had to bring up anything about this, this post fake justification, I I'm curious how it's different from the bottom line. I don't know. It feels very similar to me. Ex maybe, maybe, this one has more emphasis on the faking justifications than the yeah. bottom lining aspect. <laughs> That's fair. It's yeah. Just kind of taking it from another <laughs> angle. Yeah. Uh, I like Dean Ash's answer. Which, which is more actually... about the titles. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like um, when one metaphor fails to land, a different one could totally explain the same thing. Uh, not very articulate. We were just at a cool party. But. Uh, <laughs> Phoenix was explaining some programming stuff. Um, well, Phoenix is a, a web developer, like teacher for a for basically the Russian Google. They're called Yandex, and I did a like I was a um, fake student yesterday because they had to practice for t like starting their next cohort and explaining the first project, and it was actually really interesting because I had actually done the first project before, but they changed it, so uh, I wasn't familiar with the subject material. So it was like, I was a real student almost. And so I was like, Ooh. kind of like, actually like as a student, I'm not sure what this terminology is. Like if, if I'm somebody totally new to, and it's a, uh, it's, it's just really funny seeing what like somebody who, I guess this is actually much more inferential distances, but mm. it was, it was interesting seeing like, can you explain that again slightly differently? No, I'm still not getting it. Can you explain that again slightly different? And it's like, oh, like the third time, like, oh, I, like that metaphor totally clicks. <laughs> and now yeah. all the other, the previous ones make sense in the light of that one. So it might mm -hmm. just be, I think some of the sequences are revisiting the same material for that reason, just exploring them more, creating a better model. 
Yeah, no, it, it, it rounds out the picture more. And I think too, if if I try to zoom out, you know, the difference between bottom line thinking and fake justifying is that you can you can bottom line reason and come up with a bunch of true statements that you actually believe to support the bottom line, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're using fake justifications, you've got your bottom line, but you can just fill the top of the page with bullshit. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's, if there's any difference, maybe that's the difference. Uh, Because he mentioned Sam Harris in this post and uh, sometime in the last couple of days, he came out with an episode with uh, uh, this awesome doctor guest he's had on before about a vaccine hesitancy. And um, it's really, you know, it's the amicable, like, Pl- I, what, not middle of the road because he takes a very very firm stance but <laughs> like reaching across like trying yeah. to be open and understanding sam harris that i like trying and, to actually understand people and why they're doing these things yeah i think he i think he understands them but i think he's trying to make it so like if they're listening they won't actually just be turned off and say okay you're a shill fuck you right. um, and so it, the yeah. audience could understand i guess probably like There's something I think really useful to having a figure like Sam Harris or other people who really go out of their way to uh, do basically like street epistemology style interviews or explorations, I think. I absolutely agree. I mean, if if all you're hearing is people giving a presentation of your opinion that you know is not doing your opinion justice, you're like, okay, they're not they're not (laughs) they're not even entertaining the actual arguments I have, you know draw your inferences from that either they can't or they're too dumb to understand it or whatever um if they're if they're actually engaging with what you actually think and in dan dennett's words if they can put it in such a way where you're like thank you i wish i'd phrased it that way mm-hmm. uh, then, then at least you really know that hey you know what they actually get me they're not just talking down to me um yeah. it's i mean imagine if all of the uh uh pro evolution um stuff you'd ever heard came from the people pushing intelligent design, right? Like they, yeah. they, they would give you, Oh, well they think, you know, your grandparents were apes. You've met your grandparents. They're not apes. So obviously that's full of shit, right? <laughs> like that. So that must be what it feels like if, if you're on the wrong side of an issue and all you get is being told, yeah, you're an idiot and you're gullible and you're, you know, all those things. So having, yeah. having somebody give you the principle of charity and actually reach out, I think is does worlds of wonder. So I was just realizing when, uh, Steven, you were talking about that, that, I was I was nodding along because I'm like, yeah, I've totally watched um, YouTube videos, listened to podcasts or whatever, and just turned them off when it's like some conservative person or some religious person or I don't know, somebody that has like different views than mine, who is totally not even trying to, not even steel man, but not even like aluminum man. Like they're just, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, these idiots think this thing. And then obviously they're wrong. And it's like, what? okay. I believe like, the you're, term you're looking for is straw man. I, I think it is. It's, Which was the trope originator of Steel Man. I know. Well, I, I realized that as I was saying it, and then I was like, <laughs> there's a word for this. Anyway. Well, I think that you, you can do with something in the middle where you're pretending to give a charitable version of the opposition, but you're not really. So, like, you, you, you can have the straw man. It's like, so, that, you know, they say your grandparents were apes, but that's obviously not true. That's the straw man. And then they're like, well, you know, they say that all of life is, you know, just in a few million years descended from each other. But, you know, we never observe change in the wild. That never happened. You know, we never, we never, you never see <laughs> that, right? There are no fossils. Right. Like, so, so that, that's, I think that's, that's, that's almost more lying. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm trying to find, there's Evolution. somewhere between straw. And but no, I, I have yeah, heard yeah. the, uh, the weak man argument where you take the, yeah. the absolute worst example of the other side and pretend that that's like the normal example. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Like you find like some really outspoken idiot on YouTube who happens to be for that cause and is like, "Look, this is what they all think," and you're like, "Exactly." Yeah. No. Actually, well, we all hate that person. <laughs> or yeah. like, you know, Stalin was an atheist, and so all atheists are like Stalin. You're like, um, no. <laughs> there's there's a good reason why you can't round up Stalin to all atheists. <laughs> but um, Rounding I up that from, I, yeah, I haven't seen very many examples, and maybe they exist of people on like the other side of rationality. Uh, <laughs> maybe they don't, but like trying to do that same thing. I'd actually be really curious if uh, listeners have recommendations for, cause I'm really interested in like kind of actually listening to what the other side of things. Um, I realize that that's really vague, but I think as a community, we tend to, you know, be for effective altruism and for like researching AI and making it safe. And just, you know, there, there's some standard positions I haven't seen a really good example of somebody steel manning uh, our position, but then still arguing against it. I think depending on uh, 
like how you draw the line or the circle around what is rationality. Basically, I would just, if, if someone's doing a really good job, I just draw, include them in the circle, right? Um, <laughs> I, I can imagine somebody making a really sane case against, um, oh, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm trying to think of like non-settled issues, but like, like Julia Galef's number- The Scout Mindset, she, she talks with uh, a lot of people in the book, and then she did a series of podcast episodes that were basically Scout Mindset in action trying to figure out, um, you know, like kind of just, just like an innocuous question, like that's not politically charged. Like, uh, is, would it be bad if, uh, Uber made their employees or was, was required by law to make all of their, their drivers and employees? Um, like what would the fallout of that be? And is that good or bad? So should, should grab an expert, uh, advocate on either side and talk to each of them individually. And she's uncertain, which is the best place to approach these questions from. In fact, purchased this book and have not read it yet. So maybe a Thanks for the recommendation. I'm going to check that yeah, out. Yeah, you bet. The book Next. was good. I was talking about the, uh, in the Rationally Speaking podcast, uh, okay. the last six or so episodes have been about things like that. The thing about rationality is it's, I mean, yes, it is also kind of like a, a, a movement and a culture, which we are pretty active in, but it's not just that. Like core basic rationality is more of a method. It's a technique of finding the truth. So there's a lot of people that aren't in the are what we consider our culture at all but like when you talk to them they're using the same basic techniques and i like basically consider them rationalists in spirit even if they aren't you know <laughs> part they don't consider themselves rationalists i personally wouldn't like call them rationalists because it comes with some other identity stuff sort of but like they're they're close enough that yeah it's 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 talking to a rationalist they're a rational person and and the, you know that that makes it like, like you said, Stephen, if you find someone that even that strongly disagrees with you on a lot of these things, but they're still using the techniques of like trying to find evidence and making their their own thinking um, logically coherent and the, the various methods of rationality that you're like, yeah, OK, that I, I basically include you in the circle of rationalism, even if you don't identify as a rationalist. Right. So, yeah, the, yeah. Apt- the, the analogy to martial arts works really well. You know, if if one nation state has been doing a certain style for a thousand years and they find another population of people on the other side of the planet who can fight really well, but aren't doing the same kinds of, of techniques while they're still martial artists. I mean, the closest I can think of is that there's some people who not only are in the rationalism circle, but who explicitly identify as rationalists who like have a strong belief in an actual Christian God. And I think they're very weird and it almost seems like by definition they can't be rationalist then but everything else they do is is very rationalist i'm like okay i guess they're, they're basically rationalists with this one glaring blind spot that i Culturally i suppose i can just accept <laughs> I, mean, I think we all have our glaring blind spots though it's just much more noticeable when it's something that we're already primed <laughs> to be like that's nah, fake well but when like... it's something as obvious as god too you know <laughs> that's what i'm saying anyway um <laughs> Let's see. Well, if anyone sees my glaring blind spots, this has been an open offer for years on the show. Just point them out to me. I want to know about them. Well, you haven't given me nearly enough money, Stephen. <laughs> to what? Point out your glaring blind spots? Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah you me- measure my, my Theton, or wait, Thetan? The, Thetan level. Yeah. yeah. That's right. The the Scientologist had me for a week, and now I'm all about getting people's Thetan levels up by giving me money. Or down? Do they want Thetan levels to go up or down? They want them exactly at the right level. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Because Thetans are like the bad aliens that telepathically take control of you or something. Is that right? I don't, I don't know. I, I think we've gotten way off topic at this point. <laughs> well, we, we can zoom out and look at, because we talked about evolution a bit, and that, that was deliberate because it ties into the next post on an alien god. Yes, which is alien one of god my favorite posts. It's so good. I actually have done this one in audio before, so we can link the audio in this podcast as well, so people can listen to the whole thing if they would prefer that to reading it. Awesome. Yeah. This is my favorite reading of yours of a sequence post. Oh, well, thank you. I listened to it a bunch of times. I also listened to uh, the one where you were doing the rationalist short stories, where one of them, I think, was use the try harder look. Yes, <laughs> that this, was good. This one, and those were my favorites. Yeah. So, All right, well, what, what, what's an alien god? Uh, an alien god is talking about evolution and uh, the fact that it there appears to be purf- purposefulness in nature. Uh, 
But if you start like looking at it in more detail, it doesn't quite fit uh, because foxes seem well designed to catch rabbits and rabbits seem well designed to evade foxes. But like that doesn't make sense. Was the creator having trouble making up its mind? Whose side is out, he on? Yeah. <laughs> which Elias one is points, good and which is evil? When I design a toaster oven, I don't design one part that tries to get electricity to the coils and a second part that tries to prevent electricity from getting to the coils. <laughs> it would be a waste of effort. <laughs> So he points out that the ecosystem would make much more sense if it wasn't designed by a single who, but by a horde of deities. <laughs> this is always a compelling thing that, and this is where I, like during my new atheism argument years, I would kind of like, th this would be like my meet in the middle with religious people. And I'd be like, look, the argument for a conflicting pantheon is way more compelling than the <laughs> argument for a single intelligent deity, right? What would they say? Uh, it would vary. I mean, it, I, it's been so long. I imagine right. some answers were something along the lines of like, well, you just don't understand the mystery. We can't understand it. Um, mm. Obviously, the idea of tons of gods is, is insane and, and you're ridiculous for entertaining it. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's things like that. But I, I do feel like that's a nice meet in the middle spot, even if it's not one I actually believe. It's like, okay, look, you think it's one. I think it's zero. Like, let's pick a third and just say it's a bunch. That also explains the evidence a little better than, than your position. And I'm it, it answers the questions that you're thinking I can't answer with my zero answers. So, yeah. Why so does it's God like, really... Go ahead. Oh, okay. I was going to say, why does God really care about, you know, the speed of light never being exceeded, but also really cares about having butt sex? <laughs> like, it seems like this is two very different gods we're talking about. That always was really funny. This, this God that you posit cares about really specific things that seem to be strongly related to being a sheep herder in Bronze <laughs> Age Israel. How weird. Specifically? Yes, he, he says, uh, we already know the punchline. What is the answer to all this purposefulness? You just say evolution. And he goes on to say, I worry that's how some people are absorbing the scientific explanation as a magical purposefulness factory in nature. Evolution doesn't allow just any kind of purposefulness to leak into nature. That's what makes it a success as an empirical hypothesis. If it could explain a toaster oven, not just a tree, it would be worthless. There's a lot more to evolutionary theory, theory than pointing at nature and saying now purpose is allowed. Yeah, this is one of those many sequences that I felt like I wanted to just like fist pump like, yeah, that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a thing I'd been trying to articulate and then like. Most yeah, a lot of the sequences and then a lot of uh, Slate Star Codex posts are just like it's the thing I've been trying to explain. Read this. Mm -hmm. It's hard to when it's Slate Star Codex and it's like an entire book length. But <laughs> right, uh, evolution. Uh, uh, one of the things that people run into, I guess, when you um, are trying to debate with theological people, is they think that if you support the theory of evolution, that means you worship the theory of evolution. Because I, I guess they can't really like disentangle this is an explanation for this versus this is the thing that we believe and believe with a capital b means you've got to like go to mass and say that it's great and stuff evolution's yeah. terrible yeah and th this this uh sequence goes like more into detail about that but uh it's it's the same system that lets elephants live to old age because it's like biologically advantageous to have grandparents but not for too long so their teeth all fall out so they slowly starve to death but they help yeah. the reproductive fitness of their grandchildren so it's fine yeah yeah fuck that god <laughs> <laughs> yeah he points out what would it cost evolution or the evolution of elephants because he said there's as many different evolutions as there are uh, reproducing populations uh to ensure that the elephant just dies right away when the teeth fall out instead of slowly and in agony the elephant won't reproduce more or less anyway. Or just and like has some kind of natural Novocaine type thing yeah. get pumped through its entire body after it gets to a certain age. Because like, if there were any kind of intelligence behind this process, it's like, okay, it's advantageous to have the grandparents. And then like, they're going to slowly deteriorate and die and it's going to be miserable. Maybe we could just start pumping out the like the painkillers and mm -hmm. make, make them really high until the ends of their lives. Nah, yeah. that, that, that wouldn't be efficient. I mentioned that on the most recent episode of uh, the um, Not Everything is a Clue podcast we're doing. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, if I was God for a day, it would be a really good day for animals. You know, it, the, <laughs> the second that the gazelle is tackled and it's getting bitten into, then suddenly it's just got a euphoric rush of, you know, not some ma you know, external input of morphine or something because it need, it'd need to be like invisible and indetectable, but 
something just turns off like it 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 no longer is aware of the pain or it just you know its consciousness it becomes disappears a, becomes a pea zombie gazelle yeah and so then for like the last minute that it's being ripped apart it's no one's suffering you know have you recently read this post just before we recorded no no okay just a thing on your mind anyway yeah i guess so uh the the, the unfairness of like what a shit deal the like not on the drive back from Colorado Springs, we're talking about the the human condition and stuff like like this related to humans. But the the shit deal the animals have, have always gotten from this, uh, you know, I never got over the example of the Ichaemenidae wasp, which I think mm. was the main thing that pushed Darwin towards his agnosticism, mm. and it, it, it lays its larvae <laughs> in a paralyzed caterpillar, and then the larvae will hatch and will eat the organs of the caterpillar in the order that it takes, or in the in the order. That leaves the caterpillar alive for the longest as possible. And no doubt it hurts the caterpillar. I I mean, I hope it doesn't, but if caterpillars can feel pain, no doubt it's an agony and that's fucked up. So nature, nature seems like most things can feel pain because it's really good for your reproductive fitness. Yeah. If, if you're not aware it hurts and you don't know to get away from it. So that seems like thing number two or three on the list of things you need to, to, to have, have some genetic fitness. Um, but that is all part of what he says. Uh, he ties this back to the previous post of faking justification, like all this stuff we're talking about. He's saying human beings fake their justifications, figuring out what they want using one method and then justifying it using another method. There's no evolution of elephants fairy that's trying to figure out what's best for elephants and then B figure out how to justify it to an evolution overseer who C doesn't want to see reproductive fitness decreased, but is D willing to go along with the painless death idea so long as it doesn't actually harm any genes. But it turns out there's no advocate for elephants anywhere in the system. There should be advocates for elephants. Well, yeah. I think if, that's the system, if the system had, if, if any, if the system was listening, then you know we could someone could argue for it. But instead, we just have to to take over the system, right? Yeah. We'll we'll make it a yep. we'll make the the universe a less suffering place. Yeah. Yeah, he says we tend to rationalize reasons why our design improvements would increase reproductive fitness. We are simply, but it turns out we are simply the embodied history of which organisms did in fact survive and reproduce, not which organisms ought prudentially to have survived and reproduced. It's very much a descriptive thing rather than a prescriptive thing. Like water flowing downhill and equally benevolent. Yes. Which is to say, what do you mean benevolent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So he goes into the the gods thing here, which is where the post really just like starts touching all my um, emotional this is awesome buttons, like like Jace was saying with the fist pumping. He says, uh, if we ask who is more correct, correct, uh, just just two and a half more months of having these fucking condoms on my teeth and then I can talk right again. <laughs> He says, if we ask who is more correct, the theologians who argued for a creator god or the intellectually unfulfilled atheists who argued that mice spontaneously generated, then the theologians must be declared the victors. Evolution is not God, but it is closer to God than it is to pure random entropy. And he says uh, that Damien Broderick said gods are not ontologic. Gods are ontologically distinct from creatures or they're not worth the paper they're written on. And indeed, the shaper of life is not itself a creature. Evolution is bodiless, like the Judeo-Christian deity, omnipresent in nature, imminent in the fall of every leaf, vast as a planet's surface, billions of years old, itself unmade, arising naturally from the structure of physics. Doesn't that sound like something that might have been said about God? Which mm -hmm. isn't, that, that's basically everything we've heard about God before, right? Yeah, and it sort of ties into that whole, like, even some people who are pro-science sort of get this awe and want to worship evolution you know like you see people excitedly saying the word evolution or wearing a mm -hmm. shirt that says it and there's like a bunch of video games pokemon comes to mind where they glorify evolution as this just making things better process mm -hmm. which it is not <laughs> no but uh it does certainly sound terrifying and omnipresent and omnipotent and whatnot awesome in the old original version of the word yeah, like inspiring awe. And yet, yeah, the maker has and no mind. <laughs> yes. You want to do it? You do it yeah. better than me. Oh, okay. Uh, and yet the maker has no mind as well as no body. In some ways, its handiwork is incredibly poor design by human standards. It is internally divided. Most of all, it isn't nice. In a way, Darwin discovered God, 
a god that failed to match the preconceptions of theology, and so passed unheralded. Darwin discovered a strange alien god, not comfortably ineffable, but really genuinely different from us. Evolution is not a god, but if it were, it wouldn't be Jehovah. It would be H.P. Lovecraft's Azathoth, the blind idiot god burbling chaotically at the center of everything, surrounded by the thin monotonous piping of flutes, which you might have predicted if you had really looked at nature. Seriously. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking fantastic. Yeah. I, I, like, I, I love this post. I was one of those animal kids. I still am. I have three geckos. Um, but I was like the kid with like the bug catcher. I, was, I I went to my sister's soccer game one time and came back having caught a fish. And my dad was like, what the fuck? I was like, oh, <laughs> I noticed that there's a lake in the middle of the woods if you walk far enough back. So I got a hook and a string <laughs> and, oh and my God. a fucking bug catcher and filled it with water. And I was like, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Congratulations. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, hey, th- they were long, boring soccer games, but like, yeah. if you look at nature, it's really terrible. It doesn't seem to be like very much fun for anybody involved. Even top predators are just yeah. like, even top predators are stressed out all the time. They, they mentioned rattlesnakes uh, early on in this, where they said some people used to think that rattlesnakes evolved a rattle for the benefit of the things that are trying to avoid a rattlesnake but that's ridiculous and i was reminded of something i learned we have rattlesnakes here uh i see them a bit they don't want to bite you they really don't want to bite you they, they will do everything in their power like they'll they'll rattle a lot they'll make a ton of threat poses but their venom even though like it's excessive for the size of the thing they're trying to kill they need it to kill their prey so they need to ration it so like mm. Things don't fuck with rattlesnakes generally, but then, like, if they do, like, as a rattlesnake, you have to be like, okay, I have to ration my venom. Yeah. <laughs> I have to, you know, like, worry about things stepping on me unnecessarily, and then I pump my venom into them, and then maybe they still kill me anyway, because I'm a snake and I could die easily, but, like, this thing yeah, will die, I- but it'll take a few minutes. Right. And now I've got no every, venom. <laughs> every altercation you get in is another chance for, for injury or death. I, I learned that's one of the reasons predators they don't they don't really like going up against things that can harm them. They're always going for the the weak or the young or you know, things that won't Old put up sick. much of a fight. Yeah. yeah. Cause every single time they want to eat, they have to go and risk being, you know, killed in the process or, you know, maimed, injured some other way that's gonna give them permanent disability in life. I mean, obviously they aren't thinking of it that way, but the way it shakes out is that yeah they they prefer not to get in beefs so if you can just make yourself look really big and scary they'll be like oh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go find a baby human instead it'll <laughs> be less of a fight a human. most things don't yeah, like yeah. humans i yep. think we don't taste very good or have very much meat and we're annoying uh <laughs> there's also animals like the shrew or like badgers that just pound for pound or like they know no fear because they right. know that it, like a, a tiny shrew is like the size of your finger, but an owl will try to attack it and it'll just go, ah, that's what you think, mm. motherfucker. I'm going to bite you. <laughs> I'm going to bite. And they're like, I'm going to go find a mouse or something because this thing's insane and it's going to scratch me and then it'll get infected and then I'll die. Mm. You could just get a little scratch. Like it's, it's a, it's a shrew. You could kill it very easily. But if it's just snapping at the air furiously, it's like, eh, that's really bitey. I'm going to find something less bitey. Yeah. So anyway, nature's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Most of human civilization has been the, the, you know, trying to beat nature into submission, make it a little less terrible. Yeah, that's another interesting shift that has happened. I, I find it interesting that, like, uh, even the Bible is, like, very, and, and sort of religious cultures that came up from the Bible, they have that, like, humans are the, I don't know, the emperors of the earth. Like, it's for us. God made it for us. And we're supposed to, like, subdue it. And, in fact, it's morally right to cut down trees and to sow crops and to like domesticate cattle and now as we're developing more of a conscious conscience as a species like oh these practices are destroying the planet maybe this is not good it's just it's like oh we dominated nature too hard fuck (laughs) i mean nature was always the terrible thing that was trying to kill us and now we've we've dominated so it still is sometimes yeah now we've dominated so much that we're like oh shit we're, we're throwing out some of the balances we need to actually support the earth life support system yeah Anyway, I like the very last sentence here. Uh, I don't know, though, if... Was there more stuff to get into before that? Stephen? No, I think... I mean, 
I'm glad there's an audio version of this because anyone who can listen to this can find that one. And uh, it's it's definitely worth reading in its entirety. So uh, short, short of trying to read the whole thing, I think we can we can summarize and jump to the last part. Yeah, it, it's hard to really do the whole thing justice. Like we love it, but but read it or or listen to it. It's it's great in its in its totality. But better than just us talking about it. <laughs> so it ends with, well, more power to us humans. I like having a creator I can outwit. Beats being a pet. Glad it was Azathoth and not Odin. Which, yes, I yeah. mean. At least, like, Odin would be a god that you could be like, yeah, kill that god. <laughs> <laughs> Where, like, na- like, kill that nature has turned out not so great for us, actually. Mm-hmm. There's lots of, like, carbon emissions and stuff going on and plastic in the ocean. And we're like, yeah, we beat it. Oh, now everything's a lot shittier to live in. Well, crap. <laughs> <laughs> that does assume that you could... Yeah, that does assume that you could kill that god at all. Like, Stephen and me are, as he said... Yeah, we're reading through Worth the Candle uh, in the Not Everything is a Clue podcast. And, you know, one of the things in it is that there appears to be some sort of God and he's like outside of the universe. And I don't know if there's any possible way one could kill that God in the same way that, as we've said before, there's no way Kratos and God of War could kill any of us playing playing while we're playing the game. Eh, I, we're humans. We're really good at killing things. I'm I optimistic. Mean... <laughs> it's i i wouldn't put it beyond like if it was an actual real god being it could be literally unkillable i still think it would be um a thing we should try to do because it would be good and maybe we can but you know we we have to face the fact that it's possible it might actually be unkillable well not with that not that we shouldn't try though <laughs> yeah yeah right we will never find out unless we try and keep trying well, these are all fictional examples. We don't actually have a god that we've been able to discern. So, thank it's a lot- God. <laughs> thank God there is no god. Yes. Wasn't that that bus slogan that made people mad? Uh, I don't remember. I think so. That was like a, a Richard Dawkins Foundation sort of thing. <laughs> that rings a bell. I think there was something very similar to like "Thank God there is no god" or something that like some atheist foundation paid to put on the sides of buses, and people got really mad. Cool. Yeah, that's yeah. the good old days. That sounds familiar. Mm. All right. So for <laughs> next week, we are going to be reading The Wonder of Evolution, which sounds like the exact opposite of the horror of evolution we've been talking about. And also, evolutions are stupid, but work anyway. <laughs> Those are our posts for next time. And actually, before we go into uh, the next topic, uh, I wanted to bring up uh, something. Do you guys read Astral Codex 10? Scott Alexander's new blog? Some I get emails them. and try and read some of them. It's it's basically Slay Star Codex, except, you know, under a new name. Yeah. Um, but uh, last episode, we didn't talk about Dust Specs versus Torture, which was a sequence that was right in the line where we would have talked about it, except that we had a couple of years ago an entire episode about just that one post. <laughs> so um, did we link that in last week's show notes? Yeah, we talked about it. Our okay. listeners are smart enough to have found it. Okay, cool. So they know yeah, how to we, do we did... Google. Yes. So there was that dust picks versus torture thing, and it reminded me of the conversation we had. And then uh, Scott Alexander posted a thing about um, the COVID lockdowns. And he, well, so he said that what he found is, at least according to his reckoning, the majority of the costs of the lockdown were emotional damages. And mm-hmm. he found that really annoying because everybody else is talking about like economic damages versus uh health damages versus people actually dying and uh as as far as he could tell the stupid emotional damages outweighed everything else by an order of magnitude the same way that like when he did his research on the damages of marijuana everybody wants to talk about like you know the the be- medical benefits of marijuana and also like the fun getting high benefits of marijuana versus like the costs to society with with crime or with people getting stoned or whatever and he said it wasn't crime it's just a uh, laziness and laziness more car yeah. crashes yeah and, and he said yeah that, that's the thing he said like the one thing that overwhelmed everything by several orders of magnitudes was what effect does this have on car accidents and mm-hmm. like if it reduces car accidents then we should legalize marijuana because of that reason alone because it's so overwhelmed with everything else and if it increases it then we should probably um make it illegal or treat it in some way like we do you know alcohol because that overwhelms all other considerations which is he said it was also really dumb because no one talks about that they talk about everything else except for that one thing but um anyways yeah. he, he was he was saying that um for, on the on the uh COVID thing 
it's so stupid emotional damages people being annoyed that they can't go to the bar it puts in the parentheses i realize for some people the emotional damages were deeper than that but not everyone missed a family member's funeral i think the part that really adds up is multiplying the inconvenience of not being able to go to the bar by 300 million people um and then he goes on to say you know maybe a more courageous post would have been it, 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 talking about that kind of thing but it felt too weird and transgressive but that kind of like harkened back to me the suspects versus torture uh debate because basically the inconvenience of not being able to go to the bar is a dust spec multiplied by 300 million people multiplied by however many times you would have done that in a year and the torture is you know one or two people dying of covid and and it just reminded me of that of that conversation and how almost everyone has the the intuition that no you should always say that the torture is worse and you would choose dust specs over torture but like when you find real world examples to it the suspects always seem like it outweighs the, the the one or two deaths or the torture or whatever. I mean, it's almost like utilitarianism's right. It's almost like that, but I don't necessarily want to go that far with that caveat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That sounds like an interesting topic. Uh, I I don't think I was on the show when you guys did that sequence. I do think I it was. To say about it. Yeah, but, I think it may have been before you joined. That was, was got to be in our first couple of dozen episodes. Um, you think it was that far back? I think it was one of the earlier ones for sure. Oh, okay, cool. We could just check, but who's going to do that? So Yeah, right? <laughs> Typing words into your computer? Uh, what am I, a scientist? <laughs> I'll be down to do yeah. an episode on the COVID example and revisit it if anybody wants to do that. Although there's new things we could talk about too, so I don't know. That, yeah. that might be fun. It could just be that post, but I could see it t- tying off and just our own thoughts on it too. Um, yeah. There's, there's a lot to cover there. And I, yeah. honestly, I was going to tangent on it, but yeah, I love that idea. Let's put that on the short list. Yeah. But yeah, I, I just wanted to yeah point out that um, Scott Alexander has come out, not, not literally, but um, impl- <laughs> implied as coming out saying that torture is better than dust specs. Hmm. Well, well, well. And having put those words in his mouth, let's ignore what I just said and jump right into our main topic. <laughs> okay. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> All right. So uh, you mentioned, Jace, last time you were on the podcast, the Do This Directives. And I don't know, it sounded kind of interesting. So uh, we went, Stephen and me hadn't heard of them. So we went and looked it up and we were like, oh, yeah, this is cool. Let's do let's do an episode about this. And because uh, it's it seems like a fun, cool thing to talk about. So we're going to do that. Yeah. For those who don't know him, Derek Sivers was the guy who founded the company CD Baby. For, for all you old folks out there, if you remember CD Baby, it was where you could buy a CD online. From a website. What, what does you, CD stand for? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's um, it's like some kind of tiny record. And ah, you know, okay. It's like a piece of physical media that you would have. Anyway, okay. <laughs> um, Jesus. Who has space for physical media anymore? So he was a musician, and he wanted a place to sell his CD and found that it was really obnoxious trying as like an indie music producer to get your CD sold. Basically, like you could, if you had a record deal you could sell it in stores and on official websites online but other than that there wasn't really any centralized hub for it so he's like fuck it i'll make my own and he made cd baby and then a friend saw that and was like hey could i pay you some money to put my cd on your site too and then Hmm. more people kept doing that and then eventually it became this thing (laughs) that got quite large and he got a lot of money from it and now he mostly uh well someone bought the company uh I want to say it was Amazon or one of the things that ended up being big. It might have not been Amazon, but somebody bought it for lots of money. So that freed Derek up to make music and write a blog and what's the other thing he does? Uh, Read a lot of books and takes copious notes on them. He does do that. Oh, and programming. He taught himself to program and is in special interests about programming. And that's fun to read too. But I really like his... um. Like I would almost call him a philosopher. I, I really enjoy his philosophy. <laughs> uh, I should say that like I could actually just summarize it from the first directive. So he's got um, these six directives. How to be useful to others. How to get rich. How to thrive in an unknowable future. How to like people. What to do when you get successful. How to stop being rich and happy. <laughs> yeah. And then how to be useful to others. Uh, I feel like you can kind of summarize his philosophy here with number three, which was share strong opinions. Yes. These is just uh, these are all just like six bullet points. Each of those six bullet points, I think, has five or six or so little sub bullets. Yeah, and they're between each two like, and six. 
one small paragraph. So share strong opinions. He says, strong opinions are very useful to others. Those who are undecided or ambivalent can just adopt your stance. But those who disagree can solidify their stance by arguing against yours. Even if you invent an opinion for the sole sake of argument, boldly sharing a strong opinion is very useful to others. And I've definitely noticed him doing that. Uh, I first found him on the Tim Ferriss podcast, which I think is how his blog became popular, but uh, or his, his writings, his philosophy. But that was basically the entire format of the interview, where he sort of just set himself up in opposition to Tim Ferriss, who I like and I agree with a lot of the time. Mm. Uh, but it was this very playful sort of just like, I've I've come up with this very strong opinion now. Argue against it, and it's for the sake of both people making like solidifying their opinions more, making stronger arguments, figuring out where their weak points in their arguments are. It's great. I've like slowly tried to incorporate this, but I have a really hard time being disagreeable. <laughs> so that's something I'm working on more. I really, I mean, I, I, I really enjoy argumentation in general. I find it a lot of fun, although there's like certain, there's certain types of people who I just find absolutely exasperating to talk with. And I just kind of get annoyed and snap at them. So <laughs> there's some arguments that I probably shouldn't, shouldn't have. I, we had our, 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 you know, quarterly tanky show up at the Bayesian conspiracy discord recently. And tanky's always annoy the fuck out of me. So I, I probably shouldn't engage them. What's, what's but, this term tanky. Oh, okay. So it's a term for the type of communist who believes that, uh, you know, all capitalists should be killed, we should let the tanks roll in and Im impose iron rule. And I mean, I'm using it a little bit, um, a, a little, I mean, obviously, it's pejorative. Um, but I, I'm using it a little bit too harshly, like, I don't know, this person would come out and say, yes, there's a tanky, and they believe the tank should roll in. But it's very much an attitude of kill capitalists and redistribute their wealth, which, wait, yes, se seems like a, a tanky to me. So fuck them. Wait, do we have one of these on basic conspiracy? Every every quarter or so, someone shows up like that, and either they moderate their views or they go away. Yeah, cool. Like we're getting a bunch <laughs> of the, uh, we're getting a lot of representation of like various <laughs> kinds of internet trolls. That's not really yeah. well. It's kind of a troll. I don't know. I mean, um, is it a troll if they really believe it? No, it's something else. There's a term for that. But yeah, we took a quick break. We are back now. Um. I wanted to start out with, uh, he has this introduction at the very beginning that's interesting as to what he's doing and why he's doing it. And I wanted to touch on that real quick and then maybe uh, go from there and go through like some of his actual directives. Probably not all of them because that would be a lot, but like the ones we find interesting. Yeah. Um, but in his introduction, he says uh, that he has been reading a lot of nonfiction books and advice books and things like that. And uh, he takes copious notes on them and then he distil distills those notes down to like the most important things and then tries to distill those down even further just to get like the really good stuff out of them. So he doesn't have to, you know, have tens of thousands of pages of stuff memorized. Anyways, he says... When I tell my friends about a great book I just read, they didn't want to read it. They didn't want 300 pages of anecdotes, explanations, and supporting arguments. They'd say, just tell me what to do. I realized that for some things, I also don't want the full 20-hour explanation. I'd be happier with just the conclusions, the actions, the directives. So he's saying that he's now compressing wisdom into directives. Do this. And it's very valuable, but rarely done. Because he uh, assumes it feels arrogant and imperial to tell people what to do. Who am I to order people around? On the other hand, who am I not to? It's useful <laughs> to people, so I do it. Um, so yeah, he's, he's just, it's, you know, things like do this statements, as in, if you want something done, do this. But also, you know, it's, it's not like an order. It's like, this is what I have found to be um, useful based on what I've read. It's really interesting. Like throughout the directives, he uh, links back to some of these books that he's read. And then you can read his distilled down notes on the book. And then if you want to, you can actually get the book and read it for yourself. So you can go on a really long wiki walk. But on the other hand, he doesn't link all that many of them. So you don't get too distracted from the main point. But there is somewhere out there like the full list of his full 220 books that he's read and his distilled notes and reviews for all of them. So that's that's pretty interesting. There's a lot here if you want to, you know, really dive deep into this stuff. Yeah, yeah I like I that guy... he, um... Sorry, oh, go, go ahead, go, Steven. <laughs> no, you. You go. Okay, I'll, I'll go fast. Um, <laughs> I really I really liked his introductory thing because I'd never heard of this guy before uh, Jace mentioned it. And so, uh, you know, again, I think the first thing I found was like how to be useful to others. And I was like, okay, hold on. This is a little too succinct. I need to know what's going on. But it says part of the do this 
And then at the top of that, it says, just tell me for context, read the, just tell me what to do. And I had my, my wife read this. I thought that it was interesting enough to share. And I think I've complained before about, you know, like my, my, my go-to example is always, um, Peter Singer's Animal Liberation, the book. Is this like uh, nonfiction books that are like just a few directives, but they have to pad them out to make them book sized? Basically, I mean, so it for me, it's more just like uh, if I already buy the premise, you know, you sold me in the opening argument, like I'm convinced. And then the next 300 pages are just backing it up, which is great if you're not convinced yet. But if you're like me, it's like, I wish I hadn't spent 20 bucks on this book because I only re- needed to read the first 15 pages. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, I don't need. 80 pages on the state of factory farming in 1975. Like I know it sucked and it still sucks. Right. So I, I already believe that. And it's great to have the information there, but just having the, the succinct version, this is like the ultimate distillation of give me just the succinctness. Yeah. (laughs) He does say that sometimes like he gives an example of how, of what he's doing. He says, um, there was this observation in a book, behavioral psychologist Stephen M. Garcia and Ashlam Tor showed that merely knowing about merely knowing there are more competitors in a competition decreases our performance. And there's also a link, you know, back to the book where you can actually look up the the studies that they use to make that assertion and so forth. He said all this distills down to the advice, avoid awareness of competitors. So th- that that's basically what he's doing. He's taking this big old, you know, massive thing and boiling it down to the shortest thing you can give to someone to give them advice if they want to do something. Or like specifically, uh, this is a thing that I have a problem with because I read tons of, I mean, like my reading list is stupid. Um, I'm also like concurrently reading a bunch of things, but I read tons of nonfiction uh, that is supposed to be instrumental books about like how to mostly like, I don't know, a lot of psychology things about how to, fix your mental shit or you know stuff about productivity or how to learn better and faster and retain more information but uh maybe the thing i thought steven was complaining about is something i should just complain about if he's wasn't talking about the exact same thing but i do find that this is not always the case um there's some books that like every paragraph is gold but they're few and far between um having worked in a library and knowing some stuff about the the industry of publishing books uh there are like accepted formats so like there's authors out there that are very knowledgeable and it's not even i would say their fault necessarily that their thing ends up being not instrumental or not like or or so dense that it's really hard to extract the nuggets of wisdom from it uh but you could write uh basically a blog article or an article for a magazine though those are rare um or you could write a novella, but novellas kind of went away for a while and they've started to come back a little bit, but there's not really a big market for them. It's like baffling to me why there aren't more nonfiction novellas. That should be a new book category that comes out. <laughs> but um, I feel like like you need to settle a book for a certain amount of money in order to make enough to live. Yeah. And uh, for that amount of for it money... To be a book, though, it has to be a certain page count. Right. Well, I mean, that's the thing. Like, people are like, well, if I'm paying this amount of money, I want this many pages, which I kind of think is dumb. I would prefer nowadays. (laughs) Yeah. I would prefer, I would like pay more for a smaller thing that's been distilled down. But like, the the psychology is if I'm paying, you know, 14 bucks for a book, it needs to be at least 300 pages long. Otherwise, I'm being ripped off. And so people patch it out. Which is very silly because you're not paying for the size of the book. The size of the book doesn't correlate with how much wisdom it has in it, like how much or how much information. But, uh, that's just, you know, a fact of the industry. So I really appreciate that Derek and some other people are doing this service. Um, There's also, I have a subscription to, I'm not affiliated with them at all, but Blinkist, there's an app that does the same thing. And it has uh, mostly nonfiction, I think. Um, But they've started like broadening out to other categories. It it, it, um, will summarize a full book in a few like a few minutes like, you shared this with uh, me and it's uh, awesome yeah. it, it, it depends on the size of the book and then how much there was to extract from it which that's actually another fascinating thing sometimes like the, the size of the book doesn't necessarily correlate with how much the the blinkist version is able to pull out of it but um i do like blinkist because it has a a version that you can read and usually it, it takes a book and condenses it to say five ten pages or so um and then there's also an audio version of each of them 
which is really great if you're running around doing chores or whatever and you want to read 10 books in a row you could do it in a couple hours but um interesting i gotta it's check also this thing just, out i find it a really good way to just get a taste of books that i'm interested in and if i'm like wow that was like really interesting or some, something that like i want to hear more information about that then i will buy the full book so like this is not to say that like non-distilled versions of books are always worse or that like they're necessarily just a few instrumental bits with lots of padding around them. I think that, for example, the book, um, The Courage to be Disliked, I listened to the blankest audiobook distillation of it, and I remember telling a bunch of people, this was really good, this is an interesting book. And then a bunch of people read the book, and then they were telling me things about it that I didn't know because I hadn't read the whole book. Then I was like, shit, I gotta read the whole book. <laughs> and in fact, oh, that's thanks. one of those ones that I had to listen to, or I had to read slash listen to three times in order to even start to incorporate the whole model. But, so um, was it worth in that particular book reading the whole thing? Absolutely. I think it's probably not always the case. A lot of the stuff I listen to on Blinkist, I'm like, eh, I guess that was interesting. Next. And then, but then there's a bunch of things that I've just continued to suck a lot of value out of reading and rereading. One, and it's a way to just discover stuff. Yeah. That's one of the advantages of things like Blinkist where you can, the things that aren't that valuable, you go through fast. And then the things that are, you can really dig into them. Yeah. I do think that a lot of um, context... Like sort of the thing we were talking about with the sequences earlier, where people build that you have to sort of build a mental model that you can rotate around and figure out how all the pieces fit together when you're learning a new concept. And distillations aren't necessarily the best way to get a real solid model. I think the long, the well written, like long form books do this really well. There's there will be a chapter about this subject, and they'll hammer on this subject from a bunch of different angles, and you'll get a really good model of it. But also, that's a big time sink. And let's say that, like, you're it's looking almost for like stuff reading about... a whole sequence of things about a topic. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know. So you're, you're trying to learn more about productivity, and there's just a million bajillion productivity books out there, and you're just starting from zero. It's like, who's an expert here? That there's not really a good way to, like, I mean, like, I guess <laughs> I've got a lot of great recommendations from the Less Wrong, like, website, and it's Diaspora from people. But, like, if you just don't really know where to start and you're just somebody that wants to get more productive, it can be incredibly overwhelming looking at this super long list of books that sound very authoritative or very compelling. You know, like, the one trick that will change your life forever is a lot of the kinds of titles that books are marketed with. And you're like, all right, what's the one trick? <laughs> I think this yeah. is also um, a way to cut through bullshit. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at because there's a lot of markety bullshit out there. So let's to to get back to um the thing that we're talking about. Okay, so the first one is how to be useful to others. And the big bullet points on that one is one, get famous, two, get rich, three, share strong opinions, and four, be expensive. Um who would would like to start? So I already did share strong opinions. Uh yeah, share strong opinions. Is, does that count as yours then, or should we go? I don't know. Like, share strong opinions is kind of the thing you do as a podcast anyway, for the most part, right? There's three more, so um, there's three of us. So I'm going to do number one: get famous. Hmm. I'll, okay. I'll I'll just say real quick too. When I read the um, have strong opinions, I realized that I like basically never do that. I'm all my my, I... my position is almost always like oh, I don't know. It sounds like a nuanced issue. So <laughs> I, Stephen, I'm not, to be I'm not fair, good at that one. I think the thing that you do is actually really useful I've, when I've not been on the podcast or even when I have, or like I'm, I'm in a multi-way discussion. I think it's also really useful to have somebody who's aggressively neutral sometimes <laughs> just to huh. sort of be the one who's pointing out things that don't make sense on either side or the things that are confusing or interesting. Cause it, yeah, like, I, I don't want to necessarily like say that you should stop doing that thing that you do because that's also useful. <laughs> well, I, pr I appreciate that. Actually, before we get into the details, like just just looking over this list, how how much do we agree that this is how to be useful to others? Because I was thinking, you know, I'd be seeing something like help them when they need help or be available or something. And like the things that he actually says are like, OK, I mean. You're right. Those are absolutely the highest value ways to be useful to others, but holy shit. I think this is uh, another way that Derek is doing the thing of kind of 
being a troll in a way where it, not necessarily, but it, it's it's the it's number three share strong opinions. Yeah, he's not trolling; he's sharing strong opinions. I, I think that's all of these, honestly. It's sort of like this is the best way that I know to do this: fight me. But like in a yeah. in a friendly way. Um, another thing I should say is if anybody likes Derek's stuff, if you email him, he writes back. Really. I mean, he's like probably a billionaire. <laughs> I don't I don't know how much money he made off of CD Baby or if it's still floating him along, but he's this like unique kind of person that does just put a ton of time and effort into communicating with people. I, I like him a lot. So that's well, my shit, like. Maybe we should have asked him to be on this podcast. Hey, maybe we could. I don't know. Ooh. If you would, but be worth asking. So um, it's... since there's yeah there, there's four here. So and I already did one of them. Uh, can I start with Get Famous? Sure. <laughs> I mean, we, we won't, Wait, we won't have time. No, I wasn't. I was just going to say, like, we won't have time to go through all of these is the thing. There's a bunch of them and we only have like an hour and a half. So like, yeah. if, if it's a thing that you really want to touch on, then yes. I mean, it's quick. Get famous. Do everything okay. in public and for the public. The more people you reach, the more useful you are. The opposite is hiding, which is of no use to anyone. <laughs> I think that's I think I was, I was going to bring this one up too. That's that's why I was going to bring it up too because we're we're all doing this with you know public facing personas and um it it struck me as relate like th this is the sort of thing we're already doing. Yeah, yeah sort of. I, it, it feels like the whole um. So I will be the first one to admit that I have a uh, strong narcissistic streak, but the whole do everything in public and for the public sounds like something that would be hard for someone who is not already naturally narcissistic to do because God, that's a big ask. I super so want to hide. This is being on this podcast has <laughs> been really valuable for me or any time that I've been forced to do things in public, because I think this is true. Uh, at least if you're going to do stuff, but like you do it yourself and you hide it from everyone, like it's, Unless it's, I don't know, self-care, like you're taking a, a bubble bath or whatever. But like most of the time, like, I don't know, like YouTube has had people monetizing their weird, bizarre hobbies and special interests. And there's a market for that out there. And I'm so happy when I can find, uh, there's so many gecko blogs. I love geckos lately. Uh, that for a bit, but <laughs> fun fact about me. And there's so much gecko content now. And I'm like, yeah, people need to do more <laughs> stuff in public so I can consume more of it. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. you guys doing on um, Worth the Candle, like. It's really great listening to it and being able to relive this story that I loved a lot from like a fresh perspective. But I love it. I don't I'm, see I'm a downside. Um, well, I mean, I guess the downside would be that you cannot be if you're doing everything in public and for the public, you can't be fully yourself because there's some things that you would do um for yourself that you would never do for the public. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's part of the nature of the distillation where probably like, I think you're supposed to sort of charitably interpret, like do everything, like probably don't like literally, you know, shave your armpits in public. <laughs> I or, do not or, poop well, <laughs> for the people. <laughs> well, some people do. And that, that, that is a niche. But, <laughs> but Dude, if you could monetize cross, that, I would. I mean, you can, I don't know if you want to, but like th there's some lines, you know, there, there's yeah. reasonable lines, but yeah, you know, if you have geckos, maybe I should like make a gecko blog for my geckos and then people can so, <laughs> forcing pictures of them on people at the party last night. Look at my cute geckos. And it's like, uh, hmm. oh, it was really funny talking to Charlie because Charlie's from Hawaii and was like, oh, there's fuckers that live in your house <laughs> poop on everything. And I was yes. like, yeah, yeah, those guys. <laughs> That's how my grandma feels nice. about rabbits. She grew up in the mm -hmm. middle of nowhere, Nebraska. You know, I think uh, I mentioned yeah. her house didn't have electricity until she was a teenager. So like, I think they grew some of their own food. She did. She wasn't my, the other side of my family is farmers, but like to them, rabbits are pests. To me, they're these delightful, just proof that God is love, you know, plus <laughs> balls that uh, yeah. everybody should, should appreciate. But there, there's my strong opinion. Bunnies are perfect. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like a lot of these. Um, yeah, I guess we can, we can keep, keep rolling through, but I, I guess, oh no, I know what I was going to say about your, your love of geckos. Like in general, this is my, my general advice to somebody who's like oh you know i like doing this and it's it's kind of fun i was like then honestly share it you know i don't i i would never advocate use of twitter but if if you <laughs> if you want to do i guess instagram's the new twitter right i i'm luckily i guess I tiktok's the new instagram i don't know but what, whatever the social media thing is that you want you know that's out there um if if there's something that you like and you you like talking about it just get online make a profile somewhere and start sharing stuff about it and mm -hmm. it it's just a, it lets you 
have motivation to keep enjoying the thing you're enjoying. And then you get to see other people's enjoyment of the thing you're enjoying. And that's just yeah. great. There's no downsides. Like the worst that could happen is you, it gets ignored. And then like, then you're doing it alone anyway, which you would have been doing, right? Exactly. Okay. Okay. Uh, I did like one of these <laughs> um, on this uh, page of how to be useful. Uh, if I had to pick just one, All right, I'm picking two, take that. Um, oh, cause you said that like, I, cause I agree the way to be useful to others is like to actually help them. Um, <laughs> bullet three of get rich is once rich, spend the monies that are in ways that are even more useful to people. And so, you know, it might not be like the kind of thing of like help your friends move, but it's like, no, when you're rich, just buy move or rent movers for your friends, you know? Yeah. So that, that's one avenue of where like you're actually helping people. <laughs> but the other you one I like was all your friends expensive. Patreons. That's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, be expensive was a fun one. Cause uh, yeah, I, I have a, a friend who he's a software engineer and he, gets paid software engineer money and no one I know anyway, maybe other than him thinks that software engineers are worth that much money. <laughs> like it's not that hard. <laughs> uh, at least the level of stuff that, that most of us do most of the time. Um, You'd be amazed how hard it actually is for people that have no background whatsoever. I, I think that maybe my experience has been easier, not because I'm good at it just because I've had easy jobs, but uh, You're in, also in any smart, case, like, eh. <laughs> That's debatable, but <laughs> okay. like, that said, there was um, the, the number three of, of bullet point for your uh, be expensive was uh, people who spend more for a product or service, value it more and get more use out of it. And yeah. the, this is a great reason to advocate for a higher salary when you're being offered a job. Because if, <laughs> if, if, if you are, if, if you negotiate 15% more than they offered you, suddenly they will value you more because they're spending more money on you. It's That's a good point. It, it, it's kind of like, it seems like it shouldn't be fair. Uh, they'll also like, you know, keep an eye on you, make sure you're worth that much money. But it's, I think there's this kind of, um, I don't know, it, if you buy a house, you suddenly justify the the use, like the expense of like, well, now there's an HOA, of course, electric, electric bills and stuff. And I've got to buy my own refrigerator when it breaks. But, you know, I'm not renting. And so like, you, you like pretend like it's a really good investment. And granted, it's possible to make money, I guess. But like, because I'm spending a bunch of money on it, I'm convinced that it's like this this thing that's worth doing when in fact there's good reason there's good arguments to be made about why it's not worth doing. Yeah, it's interesting that like it takes the, you know, be worth something to other people in a very literal sense. Like they literally will will find you more worthwhile if you cost more. And <laughs> I I'd like that. It you know, also I guess give some insights into dating, maybe. It's it's no, yeah. it, it, it has a lot of knock on implications. I like this for a lot of reasons. Uh, if you charge more, it also shows that you respect yourself and your time and skills as, as slash abilities. Like you have higher self confidence. It's justified when other people will pay for you, and it also like it sort of weaponizes the sunk cost fallacy. And that's the thing that I actually enjoy when um you know it's a kind of a drag that we have all these cognitive biases, but you can totally weaponize like uh, peer pressure. You know, hey, like, let's do a book club to force myself to read this book and discuss it, <laughs> and all and my friends, or a uh, sunk cost fallacy. I'm gonna pay twenty bucks a month or whatever for this gym membership, so I'm like, oh shit, I've got this gym membership. I gotta use it, and you force yourself to go to the gym. Oh, I mean, having this podcast is kind of a way that we force <laughs> ourselves both to hang out with each other and to talk about interesting things, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's great. Everybody should have a podcast. Mm-hmm. But they should air it at different times from hours or something. Or not, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Step off my turf, homies. <laughs> Listening to this in real time. Uh, all right. Shall we move to a different directive? Yeah. The next one on the list is how to get rich, which was an interesting one. I basically pulled out every single one here because I thought they were all interesting. But um, let's go down the list first, and then we can pick out things that we find more you know, to talk about. Uh, they are number one, live where luck strikes. Number two, say yes to everything. Number three, learn the multiplying skills. And he says the multiplying skills are speaking, writing, psychology, design, conversation, second language, persuasion, programming, and meditation slash focus. Number four, pursue market value, not personal value. Number five, shamelessly imitate success. Number six, be the owner, not just the inventor. And number seven, benefit from human nature. Uh, does anybody want to jump on one of these? I love all of them so much. Uh, I want to do pursue market value, not personal value, because okay. that one was the most like puzzling for me. 
I think I get more value sort of out of the ones where I'm like kind of skimming through and going like, yeah, check mark. Yeah, check mark. Huh? This is one of the huh ones. Pursue market value, not personal value. So he says, do what pays well. Don't be the starving artist working on things that have great personal value to you, but little market value. Follow the money. Tells you where you're most valuable. Don't try to make a career out of everything you love. For example, sex. (laughs) And this reminds me of, there was this friend I had in high school who could draw just perfectly with a ballpoint pen. You know, there's like people that are just irritating like that. I'm like a pretty good artist after having practiced a fuck ton and having a degree and stuff, but I can't do that. I have to like use geometric shapes to block everything out and perspective grids and stuff. And this kid was like, yeah, I think I want to be a librarian or maybe like do finance or something. And I was just uh, mentioned that this was a kid from uh, Taiwan (laughs) where there was some different cultural values going on. But I was very baffled by this because I was like, what the hell are you talking about? You could be like artist for pay right now. And she's like, but I like art. If I, if I did art for money, I'd start to hate it. And (laughs) sure enough, I did in fact experience that when I tried to pursue careers in places where I had passions, it can grind you down. When I worked in the video games industry, like there were long stretches where, I mean, video games had sort of been like, I, I was you know playing this one MMO for six years and that was like my whole social life and how I learned things about economics and, and about like social interaction and just all kinds of stuff. But like when I was working for a video games company, I stopped, like I came home and I was like, the last thing I want to look at is another video game. <laughs> And it was sad because, like, I wasn't enjoying video games anymore. Uh, I think that this isn't always true. There's definitely, like, people out there who are super lucky and are able to do what they love and it doesn't grind them down. But, like, for the most part, I think it's really important to kind of separate what thing you're doing for, like, to, to bring value to your community, whether it's your, like, local community or fellow humans and then, like, getting paid for that versus yeah. bringing value to yourself. It was, I think it was one of the, because he links three different things in uh, in Pursue Market Value and a Personal Value. I followed the links, and one of them was a book that talked about uh, that specifically. And the thing they said was that generally, as people get more uh, proficient with a, a craft skill, they start loving it more and more. And like, the better you get, the more you love it. And eventually, like, it becomes your vocation. It becomes like a thing that you are passionate about because you're good at it. And yeah. so don't necessarily start at like, oh, I'm passionate about this thing. I'm going to go do it. And then you kind of suck at it. And then it's also a pain in the ass. And it's how you pay your bills and you hate it. It was it, The advice was more along the lines of like, you know, just do something that's valuable and that you're good at. And the fact that you're good at it and can keep doing it and be rewarded for it will make you more passionate about it. Don't Don't try to hunt this vague, I have passion for a thing that you try to turn into a career. Yeah, I... Um don't want to talk forever so someone else can get to a thing but in some of other some of Derek's other writings I read a really similar thing where someone had asked him if like CD baby hadn't taken off uh what would you do instead and he said I would or uh, actually like I think the question was something like if all of your wealth disappeared and you were like left with nothing and no experience and had to start over what would you do and he said I'd go on a job board and I'd like take any job that pays and then just like throw myself into it and I read a lot of his other writings that talked about the value of just like learning to love what you do versus trying to do it the other way around. I think it's really common, especially in the U S where like we really have this culture of believing we can have it all in sometimes delusional and harmful ways. Like I experienced that with, uh, I used to hate graphics design when I first like was learning art, I was learning fine art. I was doing acrylics and oil and charcoal and, (laughs) mixed media sculpture and i was like uh people that care about fonts and now i'm one of those people that cares about fonts there's good fonts on this <laughs> uh website by the way i like the i like how clean it is but like i ended up by having to learn graphics design because it was what paid liking graphics design i have a weird love-hate relationship with it i should say but i still look around at billboards and marketing things and be like man that color scheme wouldn't have done that or like oh that's a really good font pairing cool. <laughs> it's it works I've tried to channel that into other jobs that I've had too, and especially the unlovely parts of that job where it's just like, okay, I'm just going to learn how to like be really good at doing this thing. And then it starts to feel really good. Yeah. Shrug. Uh, all right, Steven. Um, or did you want me to do a thing? You go ahead. I, I, I guess 
to me, uh, this will call out something I think we will touch towards more towards the end, which is number two is say yes to everything. Um, <laughs> I forget which other directive it's under. It might be the one to be happy. It says, don't say yes to everything. Only say yes to things that make you say hell yes. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I like that some of these ends seem to be contradictory. There's actually I think that a story one specifically that. was yeah that one specifically was underneath uh what to do once you're rich and yeah he says you know you have to pivot and change your strategy or something to the, that effect. He has a whole essay about that, but uh yeah that's something that he gets into a lot. I don't know. As long as we're talking about say yes to everything, like I there there was a period in my life around the beginning of when I started doing the HPMOR podcast where that was just my philosophy. I was like, fuck it. I'm saying yes to everything because my life is in a rut and it sucks and I'm just going to, you know, try everything. And so, you know, when someone said, hey, do you want to go to a baseball game? Normally I would say, fuck, I hate baseball. No, especially watching it live. Oh, my God. But instead I was like, yep, doing the thing. Uh, someone said, hey, can I get some help to install these shelves in my house? I was like, yep, I'll be there. And like it, like he says, it just opens up so many different opportunities. And later on, once there's, you know, um, once I guess you have more quote unquote value to people, there's a lot more demands on your time and you just can't do that anymore. But when you're starting out, saying is to everything is just a great way to cultivate a lot of, um, not just a lot of unique starting paths and opportunities and contacts and stuff, but, um, like, he said, like number one, the one I was going to talk about is the for luck strikes. It presents you a lot of opportunities to get lucky. Like a lot of, a lot of life does depend on luck, but like luck doesn't just come out of the blue. There's, there's a whole ethos to cultivating a luck rich environment that makes it more likely that you're going to luck into something. And, and that's what that's all about. Just creating tons of opportunities for luck to happen. Mm -hmm. I almost wanted to pick number one, but I figured I'd go with one of the weirder ones this time. I like, I like that one, though, if somebody wants to talk about it. Steven, did you want to talk about Say Yes? Or? Um, I, I guess I have another an anecdote like the, like Inyash is. Uh, I, I took this wisdom from, I forget which of the spew witches it was in Methods of Rationality, but it <laughs> might have been uh, uh, Greengrass, because her, her father, Lord Greengrass, gave her the advice of, like, you need to like see his opportunities that are presented to you rather than just like instinctively say no to things. Cause otherwise you make a habit of saying no, and then you pass up on good opportunities. Mm -hmm. And when I started my yeah, first software job, guess. Oh yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, when I started my first software job, I was still digging my way out of debt. And I think I was like three months into the job or no, I mean, I was, I was like a month in cause the, the trip was three months in, but a friend of mine, actually the same guy through the party last night, invited me to go to Japan for 12 days. And nice. I'd had my passport for like six years at that point, just in case I'd never been outside the country. <laughs> and I immediately was like, nah, man, that sounds like, you know, too much. Plus I, you know, dead and I, I, you know, traveling. And, and then I, I heard that voice in my head. I'm like, I'm, and I messaged him back and I was like, actually, no, let's, uh, yeah, put me on the list. What, tell me, tell, tell me more. Let's, let's look into this. And I went and it was a great time. Um, nice. it's, you know, no, and that's, that's like a, a really easy example of like, or rather that's a really not generalizable example because you know that's like oh yeah you got to go take a, a two-week vacation that said we stayed at airbnbs and i think the entire trip cost less than two grand including plane tickets it was awesome but cool. uh i mean i went with you guys last year or maybe the year before to uh milk bar you know i that was my <laughs> every five years i'll try to go to a club and make sure it's still not my thing <laughs> but I, I try to give it an earnest effort. You know, this year, if I can, I'm going to go to a concert. We were going to go to a Kesha concert um, in like February or March of 2020. Uh, we'd, we'd had the tickets for months and then the, you know, I think I canceled and we got the refund and everything. But I've, I've been to one concert and it's, they're not usually my thing, but that was me, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. So worth trying again. I would definitely. definitely, I mean, I guess it depends on, it depends on what your personal tastes are, but I have always hated the really huge concerts. Once people get really big, I much prefer going to like a small local venue where you can get right up on stage and there's maybe just a few hundred people around because those are, I mean, even though the bands aren't going to be the ones that are really popular and that, you know, every, every um, lyric to, it's just, it's more intimate. It seems a lot of fun. If you haven't tried one of those, I would try one of those at some point in your life because they're cool. Right on. I've yeah, that's the kind of comedy really, clubs I like too. Yeah. yeah. I've had really good experiences with both types. 
um, for a like lesson to it, or I don't know, I forget what you said about the example, but <laughs> I sh- want to share that uh, one of Derek's stories that solidified this directive for him. Uh, he, when he was like first starting out as a musician, he was hanging out with some other friends that were musicians and trying to take any gigs he could get. And one of them was like, man, some fucking pig show in like Idaho. I forget if it was in Idaho or it was some random, some pig show in some random farm place wanted somebody to come play a guitar for 20 bucks or something like that. And he's like, fuck yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> give, give me that. Oh. And he spent more money, I think, taking the bus there and back, but made yeah. a bunch of connections that ended up launching his music career. So, Oh, awesome. <laughs> well, actually, uh, he, he met like, he, he worked as a circus, uh, who's the person that announces the circus? I get the ringleader, I guess. He became the yeah. ringleader of a circus because of the connections he made at this pig show. <laughs> that was what he did before CD Baby. Huh. That's cool. Yeah, like, if you leave yourself open to opportunity, uh, at least, like, I, I've tried to do a lot more of, like, I, I was actually doing an experiment with risk tolerance for a while. I'm, I'm still trying to improve my risk tolerance because I know I'm really risk averse naturally like i I say no to things uh i expect ahead of time that things are going to be bad but like when i'm able to just like say yes to things and try to keep myself open to the experience you won't always have a great time but like you end up having a time yeah you have more stuff to talk about yeah yeah it'll be parts of your life that you remember as opposed to just you know okay this was the last 12 months where i went to work and came home and i guess i got a year older hot sucks yeah i think there's still something super valuable about going to the baseball game or going to the club and just realizing okay i've learned to think about myself i still hate baseball i still hate (laughs) nightclubs but like maybe you can learn a little bit more each time or more specific things like maybe uh music venues that are small like I, I don't hate going to concerts i just hate really big loud concerts with lots of people people pushing and you can't see the performers and stuff but yeah yeah and th- this goes a bit beyond but as long as we're giving advice like that um because i'm having a strong opinion uh even in experiences that you're not having a good time i think it's possible to find aspects of it that are enjoyable or at least valuable mm-hmm. you know like yeah. i i don't really enjoy baseball um i've been i haven't been to a game in, in like 20 years but I imagine if I went, you know, I could have fun. You know, I don't care about the score. I, you know, you can't really see the ball unless you've got a good seat or something. But like, you know, you're you're there, you're relaxing, you're chatting with your friends, you're enjoying the atmosphere of the game. Um, you know, it. I was talking with somebody last night, one of the guys I went to Japan with actually, and we had a sea urchin while we were there. And it turns out he had something way more disgusting mm. uh, to compare it to. Um, and that I was, was like, you know, mm. oh yeah, no, I. Like, I, I would never eat it again. It was right, terrible. No, that's, yeah, but it was good. I, oh yeah, uh, I would never eat it again. I but I value the experience of having eaten it. Uh, just it it was it was interesting, if not enjoyable. I know that's that's kind of vague, but I'm also taking too, more than my share of talking, so I want to elaborate on the point. I, oh, okay, so I it's you were taking uni. a perfectly normal share. Wait, I want to take up time. Uni is uh, Japanese for sea urchin, and it says. I just looked it up because I was trying to remember the name. But the article I found, while colloquially referred to as the roe or eggs, uni is actually the animal's gonads, which produce the milt or roe. It mm. has a light, sweet, and somewhat briny flavor and is usually enjoyed as nigiri sushi or sashimi. So either just on rice or just by itself. I hate it. I like Japanese food, but uni is super gross. That's my I've, two cents. I've <laughs> never heard a good thing said about it. But I don't know. I've never met any pe- anyone who like grew up in Japan um, talk about it either. So I know people. I know Japanese people who hate it too. But <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, should we move on to how to thrive in an unknowable future? Or are there more how to get rich things to talk about? No, let's go through it. Yeah, I mean, if we're going to get rich, we have to thrive in the unknowable future. So okay, so we're going to that one. I think it's the ne- the next logical step. All right. Yeah. The um the. Bullet points in this one are one, prepare for the worst, two, expect disaster, which I think is the same thing as one, but maybe not. Uh, three, own as little as possible. Four, choose opportunity, not loyalty. Five, choose the plan with the most options. And six, avoid planning. So, I like man, I like I avoid really planning. Like, I like that <laughs> one. Uh, so y- y- you're still talking. I'm oh, sorry. It, it's not that I like it, it's like this is the one I'll pick, but it's just funny because I think this was in uh, like, if it wasn't homage and worth the candle, it's at least homage, or it's at least referenced in every like P 
piece of funny fiction, which is like, no, man, if you have a plan, the plan goes wrong. So just fucking wing it. That, that's essentially bullet point six for maximum when options. Don't plan art. at all. <laughs> when life imitates literature in this case. Yeah. That's right. But it's like, yeah, no, I mean, any, any plan can have a can fail. So don't plan. Just just do it. Just do stuff. Just close your <laughs> eyes and run. <laughs> yeah, you're saying the first use two, the force. <laughs> Prepare for the worst and expect disaster. Sounds similar, but uh, but the first one's about pre- preparing, like mm. physically, and the second one's sort of more about preparing mentally, like having resilience. Okay. Uh, let's see. I want to do one that's not my like one of the ones that I would have necessarily been lone. Oh, okay, number four. Uh, choose opportunity, not loyalty. Have yeah. no loyalty to location, corporation, or your past public statements. Be an absolute opportunist, doing whatever is best for the future in the current situation, unbounded by the past. Have loyalty only for your most important human relationships. And I, I loved that one I'm because like- um, when I was growing up, loyalty was one of my like strongest core values that sort of were part of my cultural upbringing that I actually continued to believe in for a while. Like it, I don't know, I, I always felt like I would want someone to be loyal to me. It's like, it, 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 it seems... It seemed at the time like a really important sort of like, yeah, stick in it, stick into your guns sort of. But actually, um, I did a thing of experimenting where I just tried to do the opposite or think about the opposite. And I like that it specified like, you know, your most important human relationships. Yeah, that's where you should be putting loyalty, but not in like brands. <laughs> yeah. And definitely not about- to things that aren't serving you. Yeah, I was about to say, I think I, I'm really glad that he put that last line in there because i think loyalty to humans actually is very important and valuable and you can't really live life without um reciprocated loyalty with you know with a number of of core people but yeah. also yeah it's the weirdest thing when people get like upset that a corporation laid them off or or you know they like i can't move out of this place because this is my ancestral homeland or whatever i mean like okay i get not wanting to leave behind um friends or family that you have here or whatever but like People have loyalty to strange things that would never have any loyalty back to them. Like sentimentality don't... to like physical items, you know. Yeah, it was uh, interesting that he included past public statements in there. <laughs> I like that one though. Yeah. Like it, it, that's it's pure that, that's just the whole yeah, leaving your yourself open to change your mind about things is super important. That was part of the experiment where I tried to like do the opposite. Um, I think I talked about it before, where I would like in debates in school, I used to experiment with just standing up and then going and joining the other side after I'd like made my best argument for the one side. <laughs> oh, cool. It's just valuable to do that sort of thing. I think just to like give yourself a gut check on what you do actually believe and think. Mm-hmm. Uh, even with the most important human relationships, I'm glad that that's in there as a caveat because otherwise I think there'd be pearl clutching, but like I really strongly think relationships should be reciprocal, maybe not 50, 50 or all the time or whatever, but like, uh, there's a whole thing of like having loyalty to your shitty toxic family members or your boss or like, you know, someone you've been friends with since you were kids who you've grown apart with a lot, like the relationship should still be serving both of you. So even, even there, I think that loyalty isn't just like this kind of knee jerk. Yeah, that's good. Capital G you got to evaluate stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the loyalty to, um, look like location uh the, the, it's like people who don't leave their house during a, a hurricane warning or something right mm. and like i get like the inconvenience of like well you know most of these are false alarms or not that big of a deal or something maybe that's part of the reasoning but i think some people are like no this is my home and it's like yeah but your home is about to fuck you like it doesn't care one shit about you <laughs> it, yeah. it's, it's time to get the hell out of there Man, Hurricane Sandy, I think it was. Man, there's so many hurricanes. Uh, it was when I was still in Jersey working at, or uh, volunteering at the rescue squad. And I remember we set up a bunch of shelters and we're convincing, like, desperately trying to convince people to evacuate. And we did keep running into that whole, I ain't leaving person. Mm-hmm. And we'd go and just, like, drop off a bunch of bottles of water and, like, are you, sh- like, put, please come on the ambulance with us. Like, it's just overnight. Come on. Like, I don't know, we, we set up little tents and shelters and there was like food and water and electricity and heat and air conditioning and just like, just come camp out in a public building overnight, please. Mm. And people are just like, nah, I don't feel like it. It worked out for some people and not others. Let's just say. Yeah. 
Um, the one I picked, I don't know. Like, I'm I'm doing the opposite of Jason. Maybe I shouldn't. Um, for Jason's picking counterintuitive ones, maybe I should start doing that. Um, but anyways, too late now because the one I had picked was own as little as possible because I've always found that to be yeah. See, I'm just picking the things that reinforce the things I already do and like. Um, I, I think that's it's been always a great um thing in my life to not be tied down by things like. I, I know it's been said before, but like the your things end up owning you sort of sentiment where now you have to find a place for it to be. Now you have to spend time and money uh, keeping them up and maintaining them. And you can't uh, move locations as easily when you have a whole bunch of stuff that you got to move. I just I, I generally find things to be uh, a, a drag. Um, but the biggest exception being tools that you use with some regularity, because tools are just such a... I mean, they're the opening up of opportunities. You can do things now that you couldn't do before that that's useful. But um, yeah, the the owning as little as possible is great. He says, the less you own, the less you're affected by disaster. And I also kind of feel that because, you know, now I actually um, own a few properties that I rent out to other people. And that kind of sucks because now I worry about them all the time. Like, what, what's going to happen with this thing? Oh, my God. Like, someone broke into the cars in this one place. That's what's what's happening there. Like, I don't know. I don't I don't necessarily like it. But on the other hand, it's also like a line of stability. It's like I have this asset now that if things get really bad, I can sell it if I need it. It's it's it makes my future less uncertain to to have that. Aside from, you know, if there were to be some kind of disaster. But that's why I have insurance, right? I don't know. Yeah. If there's there's no insurance about, you know, an entire neighborhood going to shit for some reason. So uh, it's the uh, mindset of just don't be too attached to the things you own. Like, it is probably, I don't know, you've got some investment properties. That's cool. But, like, the difficulty, I think, enters that whole situation when you're spending time worrying about it, checking in on it. Uh, you, Ineash, lent me the book Walk Away. Is that a Cory Doctorow? Mm. And I yes, remember reading that and just also sort of doing that little fist pump thing. And of course that yeah. was, you know, after I moved here, after my house burned down, but I had already sort of like, again, it was one of those things I couldn't really quite articulate, but I had this sort of idea of like, I hate having stuff that I have to worry and stress out about. Is it locked up? Is it like going to get stolen? Is it going to get hacked? Is it going to depreciate in value? You know, what if it gets damaged? Oh man, I got to protect it. And it's like, I really would prefer to live a life where I could just, at any time, walk away from whatever I've got. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's really nice that having had that tested and knowing that that's a thing that I can do too. It like is a relief, but like I would feel so stressed out if I were ever stuck in a situation where it didn't feel like if I ended up in an, a, to a toxic, abusive relationship or there was a natural disaster c coming or had already happened that I couldn't just walk away and start over. Yeah. Like, yeah. Life gave you a pop quiz and you passed. <laughs> your pop quiz is more of a final exam on can you handle the walk away idea it's it's interesting because you know it does give you like stability and it, it and your future is better to have like these sorts of assets you can rely on but on the other hand it also ties me to denver now since they're all in denver and if something goes terribly wrong with denver it's really hard for me to leave this area if I wanted to, like, how to get rich, number one, is live where luck strikes, which I've heard many, many times. Like, if you want to be an actor at all, you have to move to L.A. There is no other way around it. And, like, if if I want to pursue something else with my life that requires me not to be in Denver, like, that's a huge cost to overcome that I have to, like, get rid of these places or entrust them to someone else. Uh, Hire a property it, manager. Yeah, I know. Like that's that's the thing. But you know, once you hire a property manager, you basically lose um, all the income that you could have made by renting it out. At that Not point, it just it. becomes eh, they take nine percent off they the take, top. They take a percent of it, but then that's like the amount that you don't have to worry about. It's still a passive income stream. It's, I mean, with how tight margins are on renting, unless you've owned a place for at least seven, eight years, anyone taking nine percent off the top is going to leave you with nothing, and you're probably actually going to be paying more than you're you're getting. I'm just well, the, the intricacies of real estate. You can't see uh, me because we're not in the same room. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the intricacies of real estate aside, I, I think there's. Uh, I had two things on that. One, you've done the smart thing and has diversified across like the greater Denver area. Um, I, I thought it would be fun. There's units occasionally for sale in my townhome complex, and it's not like I have the money just to throw it down on another place. But I thought it'd be kind of fun to own like four units in this in this <laughs> the, the all share parking lot. And yet, yeah. if, the, if this town and community goes to shit, then all of those investments could fall under, right? But the idea of a, of a tornado hitting all of your properties, or even more than one, is pretty low. 
So, I mean, well, any tornado, yeah. any, you know, in Denver is rare anyway, but you get the idea. Right. But I mean, they are all within a few blocks of each other. If, if there was like a major riot or a big fire that went through, that would be a problem. Yeah. But I, I, you probably at least have fire insurance. But I guess the, the other thing is less right? about. Yeah. yeah. The, the, other yeah. Less, the, the other thing is less uh, uh, particular based. And you, you, you had mentioned that like, oh, I, I'm picking ones that I already like or that like, I'm already doing. And Jace is doing the counterintuitive thing of like picking ones that that he's not already a fan of or, or not that wasn't the like the first just idea jump out to me immediately like oh yeah of course yeah but i, I guess i was just going to say that i find fun value in both of those approaches because on the one hand it's nice to see that it's like vindicating like oh i already do this and this person has put in a ton of hours of work to, and come to the same conclusion so like there's vindication there so i think it's fun mm. to see things that i'm already doing on these lists and then it's from from Jason's side, it's also fun to see things that like I wouldn't have thought of that. I should I should try that, or like maybe that's worth you know thinking about. Um, yeah, yeah. So just uh, just the two different perspectives I mean, on I've, that. Uh, I've also had these kind of kicking around in my head for a few years because man, I'm old. It's been <laughs> I was like it's been like two years, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five. Oh my god, um, <laughs> when was this written? But uh, yeah, I saw this. Oh god, this is written in uh, 2016. So yeah. <laughs> but the reason that I like wanted to talk about this or, you know, just to share it with people, I didn't know we we're going to make a whole episode is that I do keep coming back to this and the ones that I didn't, that I was like, yeah, that one's cool. Yeah, that one's cool. And I don't know about number three, number three is the one that stuck mm-hmm. in my craw and that I'd come back later and like, or either I'd remember it and like it would become relevant or I'd like come back and be like, Oh, I did that. Or like, Oh, I understand that one now. So yeah. mm-hmm. nice. Just gotten a lot of value out of these. Um, yeah. Although, we... did you want to hit one, Stephen? Are we still on the? Um, uh, I think we're in how to thrive. Oh yeah, no, in I, an I, unknowable future. I think I said it, uh, enough there. I I I like prepare for the okay. worst. You know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, and I jokingly liked uh, don't plan anything. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's move on to how to like people. I actually have more than one that I want to talk about here. Um, I don't know, Take maybe liking maybe liking people is too much of a thing that I'm into or something. I don't know. I, I Anyways, think let me go through over the bullet here. points. Yeah. yeah, there is. So how to like people. Number one, assume it's their last day. Number two, be who you'd be when alone. Number three, assume men and women are the same. Number four, always make new friends. Number five, avoid harming the relationship. Number six, act calm and kind. Number seven, don't try to change them. Number eight, find wisdom in your opponents. And number nine, purge the vampires. <laughs> uh, who would like to jump on one here? I want to jump in. Ones. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're, they're all, all great. Uh, the first yeah. one, this is, I think, the first one. Assume it's their last day. Everyone talks about living like it's your last day on Earth. Instead, to appreciate someone, live like it's their last day on Earth. Treat them accordingly. Try to fulfill their dreams for the day. Really listen to them. Learn from them. Uh, I, I think it would be impossible to internalize this and be mean to people, right? Yeah. I mean, unless unless you're yeah. unless you're a particularly mean person, I don't think anyone would want to just ruin someone's last day, right? Yeah. So I I, I like this one because this if I had to give like uh, this this is essentially just how to be nice, uh, or at least one one, a, one aspect of that. And uh, I I'm like not that sure a lot. how I'm not sure how practical it is though because I don't know when there's no future there that changes a lot of things i mean i don't know if you guys saw the recent rick and morty episode where they go on an apocalypse bender <laughs> yeah <laughs> where they I, crawl from one apocalypse to the other because you know once once you know you're not going to be alive tomorrow and all of society knows that like the, everything changes for that time period and yeah I, no i mean it, it is good advice but it's also i don't know yeah no so, I, I mean that's, um... the, that's the standard rejoinder where like people are like oh well i mean if it's my last day on earth i'm not going to work i'm i'm gonna you know do all the drugs i'm gonna whatever like so do it in a way that actually makes sense unless you can see the meteorite coming. So like, yeah. you know, try to, try to fulfill also, their dreams for wanna... the day. It doesn't mean throw away your life savings and, you know, yeah. take, give them a trip on Bezos's phallic rocket to the, to space. Right. Like <laughs> yeah. it's, it's your just... life and everyone else's life still goes on. So you can't throw everything to the wind. Right. But it, it I think there's a way to do this that like, you know, no one wants to work, but I'm going to go to work tomorrow because it's Monday and I like having the things I have and I want to keep having them, you know, like, yeah. like a place to live and food and stuff. Right. So, mm-hmm. uh, if, if, if t- 
if the world was turning off at midnight tonight, I wouldn't be planning for work tomorrow. You know, I'd probably stay up past midnight, but, uh, or at least, you know, that's, I guess there, there's a way to take this that doesn't reduce to like the, the generic, like, well, if the world's ending, then, you know, everything would be mayhem. Uh, yeah. th- there, there's yeah. a way to, to make this workable. You don't have to literally act like this person's about to die. It's more just, I think, I think if, if you catch yourself getting irritable at somebody, um, it would be like, what would I do if I like just found out that this person is, I don't know, on death row or something? That would be weird. I was right. going to say cancer, <laughs> and then that was too depressing. But like, but it is depressing. I don't know. Say like, you just found out this person's dying of cancer. You'd probably be like, oh shit, I should treat them nicer. And why do you have that like sudden, you know, why do humans just sort of have that? We take people for granted, you know? Yeah. So because if like, you, if, you if, default- if you did literally find this out, whether or not it was true that like the the old person in front of you at the cash register in the supermarket or whatever is like you know about to die then like suddenly you appreciate them more yeah you'll be less irritated that they're taking forever writing a check to pay for their groceries you know oh, it's shit, they're a human being with value i forgot <laughs> exactly and so you're like you're right though you, you hear you you imagine some bad news like that and you get this switch in your mind that goes off of like oh shit i need to you know any beef that i had with them doesn't really matter um, or almost certainly doesn't matter. And I can, I can appreciate, you know, I can appreciate things more or be less annoyed if they're strangers or something. Right. But like, mm-hmm. you could just turn that switch now. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It's like a really good reframe, uh, like a, C- a CBT style reframe. Um, I do kind of a similar thing and I, I think this is probably something else that I might've heard Derek talk about. Um, or at least was sort of a Derek adjacent, <laughs> Uh, when somebody tr- cuts you off in traffic or, you know, is just driving like an asshole, I just come up with some, oh, they're probably rushing to the hospital because they just heard that their wife's in labor, like, hope they get there in time, you know? And it just, yeah. like, it, the thing is that it's not even necessarily t- for treating them better. It's for your own peace of mind. And y- you feel happier and less stressed when you're able to forgive others. Because, like, yeah, the whole... It's true thing that's going on when you're getting irritable at the people around you is that you're not appreciating them enough. You're not like, Oh, that's a valuable human being who has depth. They're just an obstacle. You're not being very mindful. (laughs) And that helps kick you back into the, like being the kind of person that you want to be, that it feels good to be that you can like go to bed at night and be like, I was a good person today. And like, I had good interactions and I made the right choices. Even, you know, (laughs) it's, it's a good feeling. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, Jace, it sounded like you had one too. So I really like um, <laughs> number three, which uh, I think Derek also has a longer essay about this sort of thing, but assume men and women are too. the same. Yeah. Men think women are so different from them. Women think men are so different from them. But the differences among men and differences among women are far greater than the differences between men and women. Mm-hmm. So counteract your tendency to exaggerate the differences. Assume men and women are the same. And this just this works for so many things. Children and adults, uh, races older Republicans versus younger and, people. and Democrats. Yeah. yeah it's totally. like very important that the whole differences among men and differences among women are greater. That's actually like they did a, I think this probably links to this study where they did like a big five personality test and showed that while if you just, if you swap the graph, so it just shows men versus women, they kind of, they fall into two distinct categories with a big bell curve that like intersects in the middle. But then when mm-hmm. it's just all women, and all men, the, the differences are like people are way more different just inside their categories. And it's, you know, yeah. uh, individuals <sighs> vary so much from the median on so many different um, axes that it's it's like almost worthless um, thinking of them as just a, a, a category. Yeah, nobody's rep- like the one representative person of their gender and race and right doesn't like, exist. Uh, yeah, religion. And I really. I really loved this one. I think this was a, a big thing that was pushed in my childhood and I really internalized it. And I still think it's the best way to live life in general. Yeah, I think it's, it's just, just an important balancing act between knowing that there are differences, but also knowing that you can discard them because yeah, an individual is not like representative of their entire group. And, exactly. And There's differences between populations, but that doesn't matter at all on any individual basis. It really also doesn't really matter like when... 
I don't even know what you would use that data for when you're doing like regular type human interactions. Like there's someone you meet at a bar yeah. and it's like, Oh, but by knowing that they're like a black disabled woman, does that mean you need to treat them differently? Like probably you should right. treat them like an equal and like you would treat anybody else. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I think it's hard to go wrong with that route. Maybe later you find out that they have different pronouns that they prefer and like that they're, that they don't like you calling out their appearance and that, but like, I don't know, everybody has different preferences around those things. And like, Mm. I don't think anybody should belong to a special category where like you force those things on them, whether they want it or not. I find it as a transgender person, pretty uncomfortable when people go around the circle and say their name and their pronouns. (laughs) (laughs) I I think it's just like, is that a thing that happens often? I see that all the time. Yeah. Uh, And like, it's it just, it feels like tokenism. Like it would be super weird if it's like let's go around the the room and say our names and our race. Yeah, right. So you don't like I don't know if I get to personally know somebody, I'll tell them their pronouns. But I'm not like, eh. I guess I, yeah. I I I guess I know why people like doing it, but it usually just strikes me as like woke signaling, mm-hmm. wokeness signaling. Yeah, that's I don't want to end this on a sour note. So like, I'm gonna go that's back okay, and say get- I think this is a good principle. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I wow. Okay, so there's there's a few that I want to talk about. Let's. Um, I don't know. Okay, I'll go ahead and jump to the one that I think I is most valuable is purge the vampires. I would also say yeah. just indulge yourself. Talk about all the ones you want to talk about, dude. <laughs> okay. All right. Well. Okay. Um. But I I do like the purge the vampires one because um there there are people out there that are draining whether it's a personality conflict or just you know something. Um, that they actually do exploit people or whatever, but th- there's there's people out there that really are bad for you personally, if not for everyone around them. And um, it, as he says, they make you hate all people. And I think it's I I, I have this this idea that like there's some people I can help. I, I have room in my life for maybe like two or three crazy people that I that not just crazy, but like also that need a lot of work. But th- at, that's like at the most and. It's just I I can't have I can't have too many people like that because it just it takes everything out of your life. You don't have room for anything but them after a while because they take up all your energy and all your focus and your time. And it's like it's it's a, no learn learn to be your own person. I'm sorry I cannot dedicate my life to you. You say that literally on Facebook. I remember like there was I don't know I'll say Michelle just as a random name for a while I would jokingly call Facebook like Michelle book like oh let's see what's going on on Michelle book where mm-hmm. you do see because it's the feed and I, I don't know that the algorithm resorted how you see stuff but back in the old days I say as I pull out my walker and put my like little spectacles on <laughs> uh, it was just like who posted when and you, you'd see some people that would just completely spam your feed and a lot of the time it's not the person who's writing anything valuable like it's the person that's like here's a picture of my sandwich oh man i just got these new shoes here's another picture of my new shoes here's my cute kids here's 80 pictures of my cute kids man you know what i really hate when people like stand in front of you in line and then they don't inch up when everybody else is inching up and then people cut in line and you're just like, oh my god like i don't care <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, one of your other friends is like, "Hey, I just lost my job, and you didn't see it." <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of the visual representation of the way that can be. Um, I think that one really comes back to the whole reciprocity in relationships. Again, it doesn't have to be fifty-fifty. It doesn't, you know, one person can pick up more of the slack for a few months than the other can, or you can figure out some kind yeah. of balance. But there's got to be some kind of balance. There's got to be like some relationships should be giving to back to both people in some way. And if it's just yeah. draining one person to benefit the other, that's not a good. That's the definition of toxic relationship. It's probably yeah. not helping either of you, honestly. It's, sorry if I like I'm getting up on a soap. No, this is a thing that I'm trying. I'm trying to get more assertive because I'm a super pushover, people pleaser person, and I always have been. But I'm very slowly getting better at realizing that you can't. I think that was actually one of the yeah number I mean, seven. Think- don't, don't try to change people. You actually can't change people like yeah if, if somebody can't pay their rent every single month and they're always begging for money like you're not actually really doing them a favor by paying it for them you're just keeping them sort of indebted to you and uh, and helpless yeah i've i my my main um thing okay so i i feel you if you're someone who really wants to be liked by other people this can often become a big problem and you gotta learn how to get around it um but yeah, the don't change, don't try to change people is a thing that I've I've really push on myself now, and I think I've come to internalize it pretty well. Where I'm just like, oh, 
I guess that's them, and either I can accept it or I can't, because sometimes people change, and that's awesome, and I want to be supportive of that, but I always assume that the way someone is right now is just the way they're going to stay, because nine times out of ten, that is the case. In economics, don't they call it revealed preference? <laughs> yeah. I remember a piece of advice from uh, Naveen Mishra, who was on the show, I don't know, two or three years ago. We've been doing this a long time. I don't know if you guys realize that. <laughs> um, you guys are younger than me, but yeah. The phrase... Uh, when in doubt, bet on things staying the same. Mm. I don't know if that's an original hymn or not, but that's who I heard it from. And that that's something that, I, well, it, it ties into the don't try to change people. Um, but just, just in general, uh, you know, I still save for retirement, even though I anticipate that in 50 years, the world will be really different. Either it'll be really, really worse, in which case my, my numbers on a computer somewhere won't mean anything, or we won't need money. But I'm going to plan on needing money, right? Yeah. Like just in case. So yeah. I, I like that one a lot. And the the vampires one, it's funny just on a kind of meta level that like this is under the how to like people thing. Um, <laughs> it, it's not how to be happy. This right? is how to not sabotage your ability to like people. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, the second bullet point there is that they make you hate all people. Um, it's And I also just think of Colin Robinson from... Uh, yes, uh, what we do in the shadows. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the energy vampire. <laughs> But mm. yeah, uh, you know, if, if so many of your human interactions are, are negative, then you just, you don't have the energy for the good ones. Yeah. I didn't finish that. Sh or, uh, I watched like the first season. I forget, but like the character who was the energy vampire, I forget. Did he actually have supernatural powers or was he just a super bummer to be around? No, nah, he, he's got some, <laughs> they're not the same as the regular vampires, but they overlap. At some point, some he even says something like, yeah, I don't really know what my deal is either, guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so good. I gotta get back to that. Uh, I should also point out, um, we kept saying, don't try to change people. The first bullet point there, there was a caveat, dot, 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 unless they asked you to. And yeah. uh, definitely, I think, like, you can get a lot of value out of, and in fact, my favorite relationships are ones where they're two or more people that are trying to work on themselves and I don't know, like me and my partner Phoenix will work on shit like that all the time where it's like, Hey, I don't, I don't like when I get irritable and snap at people. Can you point out when I'm doing that? And then I'll try to go like drink some water or take a shower, or, like a nap or something. And cool. with sort of Crocker's rule, uh, like say anything. And we'll, like, yeah. I promise to, I, I pre-commit to not getting offended by a thing. If, I know that it's like you trying to help me notice a thing that I don't endorse that I would want to change anyway. You know, yeah. um, I think that, yeah, there can be really great relationships where, but like it's both people trying to change and grow together and holding each other accountable. Definitely. I have had lots of experiences of trying to help people like, Oh, maybe if I just show them the right way to file their taxes or clean their house or go see doctors and take care of their mental health or whatever the heck it is, then like, they, they must just not know how to do it. But yeah, like mm -hmm. your, your priors, the way that person has behaved are, are your priors <laughs> if you're trying to predict the future. But um, of, these, of these, I also like always make new friends, but I think that's like something we can have a whole episode on. Um, gosh, I, wanted yeah. to, I wanted to touch on number two, be who you'd be when alone. This one to me doesn't like, it just doesn't even make sense because like who you are as a person changes based on your environment and most specifically based on what people you're around. Like I, I can't be who I'd be when I'm alone because the fact that other people are there changes who I am fundamentally. And I, I know this and realize this, I think you know, this I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned saying, this. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. I, I no, no, this is just a different way of saying like, don't put on a face um, unless it's like, like, I, I mean, yeah, I definitely have like my party persona and my work, like, or doing serious stuff persona and whatever, but those are still the ways that I endorse behaving. I think it's more of a like, don't, you know, don't act in a way that you think is going to make other people like you more, or, like, see you as being cool or high status or whatever. Don't be disingenuous. If, if it's still ingenuous, that's, is that a word? To like, have a party persona and you super enjoy going to a party and then being like extroverted for two hours or so until your energy runs out, then that's you. I think it's just saying be you. Yeah. I, I, I really liked it. And this was one I was going to pull out. Cause I do think that, uh, 
when when Inaj was describing it, I was doing like a little happy fist pumping action because I I was stoked <laughs> on it because this is something I've made an effort towards in the last few years to try to um, be as few people as possible and like I my, when I go to work, which is to say sit exactly where I am, but uh, on a, in a slightly different context, uh, I'm more or less the same person. You know, I, I talk about half the same things if I get given opportunity. I um, still talk about my pet or whatever movies I'm watching or something like if and I, I've, I've made an effort to do this like with family, which is different because they've known you, you know, they knew the me of 15 years ago. And it's always an interesting experience bumping into a friend that you haven't seen in like 15 years. And they're like, oh, wait, who do you know me as again? And if you just don't bother asking that question. And so, yeah, you know, like at work, I might, um, I, I'm trying to think of literally anything I do differently at work. Uh, maybe I swear less or something, but even that, even that's a stretch, but like, I mean, there's a lot of political topics I would not touch on at work. Oh, sure. I mean, I, I almost, yeah. So maybe I wouldn't bring those up, but, uh, in fact, I have even shut them down before with, with my old boss, but like, in general, who I am in, in most contexts is like a natural extension of who I am when I'm alone rather than like, okay, got to put on my work, Steven face. It's I like, I like the idea of a natural extension because like, yeah, you try to stay the same person, but just being around people like changes how I feel internally, you know? Well, sure. Not, and not like when you're alone, amount. when you're around people, you hold your farts in. You know, like there are, <laughs> like j just to be as you don't as, know that. J just to be as as you know blunt about it as possible. Like there are some things you do alone when you're not with you know when you're not with other people. But I think it's yeah. it's to try try to like make it for you. It's not work. It's not effort to be the person who you are around certain groups that you are by yourself. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. I just. I thought of the fart example and I couldn't let it slip past. So, <laughs> No, absolutely. I, I think you're right. And I think that's just the best way to be. Uh, I'm I just, sorry. I, uh, you should finish yours though. Oh, well, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, it's nothing. I'm just, my, my psychology is somewhat different when there's, I don't know, maybe because of that narcissistic streak that I was talking about when there's an audience around and people to give me approval that fundamentally changes some of my, my drives and emotions. I want to say, and I think like, that calling it narcissistic much? is like too pejorative. I think I've seen you being this persona and it seems like you just genuinely like attention and like, like providing value. So people will give you attention. And I think that's fine. Yeah. That's like a good, healthy yeah. thing that humans tend to want and do and <laughs> I don't yeah know. we don't we don't I, seek social approval when we're alone in our room like there's, well, there's no I mean, one there's no one to socially approve of me social so, approval is a human need though yeah just saying no no that's what I'm saying so like if, if you're by yourself you're not acting that way but you're acting that way when you're around people I, I, I guess I want to push back on the word narcissism too because that sounds negative and it's just that that's what people do you know you, you behave differently around other people to an extent because like it's it's a human the, behavior. Yeah, the the social aspect of us is built in so deep that you can't just like turn that off. And it you yeah. know, for me even sometimes I I will notice that it's not off when I'm alone. And I'm like, "Oh wait, I can I can actually turn that off." Uh so <laughs> it's I I I lost the coherent point I was making, but yeah. I guess I just always heard that like, you know, you should always be true to yourself and always the same person or something and I'm like, "Well, I I can't." That's bullshit because people aren't one person. We have different personalities. Yeah. I think like be true to yourselves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like be be the versions of you that you enjoy being and that you endorse being. It might be the way that I would phrase this if I were writing it. I like I that a think lot the more. Word alone might be like I, I think he was going for a thing there of don't be like second guessing yourself or like trying to figure out mm. what how other people are going to perceive you. And, you know, that's stressful. Oh, and it ends up making yeah. you look awkward and bad anyway. <laughs> oh, my story. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll be quick. There's this artist I like a lot, a uh, musician, Lewis Cole. Um, he has a song with a music video called Weird Side of the Night that I recommend. This dude is like this tall, skinny white guy who always just wears big shades and doesn't make facial expressions really. <laughs> Uh, it might be like, I don't know, it strikes me as sort of an Asperger's Z, like, uh, flat effect uh, thing. Like, I, I have this thing too, unless I check for it. But anyway, he, like, is singing this song 
that has this really like funk kind of theme to it and he has these fucking gold puffy pants and is just walking down the street with backup dancers copying the dance moves he's doing but he's basically just singing into a microphone not making facial expressions and not really moving his upper body that much but doing silly leg things but it looks Hmm. fucking cool and i was really excited like talking to phoenix about how man, when I was in middle school, I tried to like mathematically figure out how to be cool because I couldn't figure out what made some people cool and others not. And like, I thought it had to do with like what color palettes you wore and particular like gestures that you use or don't use, or whether you have flat effect or whether you affect emotion into your voice and eye contact or not. And it actually, I realized like (laughs) after trying to analyze this and I feel like it just sort of like came to me one day. Oh, people who are cool just do whatever they want and don't give a shit what other people think and just aggressively are like that. Hmm. <laughs> That's the only way to be cool is to not care about being cool. And it sounds really duh when you think about it, but like if you look at this yeah. music video with Lewis Cole just really fucking owning it, like it looks very silly. And I was laughing while watching it, but like because it's great. But can you yeah. can you link it to us after after we're done here? Sure. Awesome, because then I can add it to the show notes, too. Um, okay, should we next. go on to what to do when you get successful? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I could have kept going on this one, but you're right. We've got two more to get through, so all right. Well, hopefully this one will be shorter because it only has two. <laughs> Number one, change yes to hell yeah or no. And two, keep momentum. That's what I was I think, laughing Stephen, at. You wanted to, yeah, Stephen, you wanted to talk about number one? Yeah, now that it's – I think when you click, like, next – uh, like previous or next, it doesn't take you in the same order that it is uh, like one through six on the on the root page. So I, oh, really? I read them that way, and I think that was part of the confusion. But oh, maybe it does, and I'm just Derek. dumb. <laughs> I, I, I will double check before I trouble him. But in any case, uh, yeah, the it's, I guess, yeah. So, so number one, change yes to hell yeah. And I like that because uh, like once you've made it, then you, then you don't have to do everything anymore. You just do what you want. And you, you don't have to do things you didn't want to do before, whatever made it means. And so, so that's this one I, I noodled over for like, I don't know. I read these a couple of days ago and this one I spent probably a disproportionate amount of time thinking about because I'm currently weighing two jobs, my current job and a job that is offered to me. And I have a, yeah, I suppose that's a good opportunity response to it. Not a hell yes resp- response to it. But the question is, is I don't know if I'm successful yet. So I don't know if I, <laughs> if I should say if I should, if I'm in the take the opportunity uh, camp or if I'm in the wait, you know, wait until you get a hell yes opportunity camp. I think when you are successful, you will know it because you will be at the point where you're still trying to say yes to everything and you just fucking can't because there's too much. It's it's overwhelming. And that's when you have to start paring things down, saying, I'm sorry, I committed to this, but I actually can't do it. And then you start changing it from yes to, you know, hell yeah or no. Yeah, I, this sort of falls into the same kind of metaphor category of Michelle on Facebook. And I feel bad that I use that name now because I realize I do actually have some friends named Michelle and they're not the ones I'm talking about. I was trying to come up with a <laughs> random name, but uh, when you could have gone with Ineash, no one has that name. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in scare quotes successful. <laughs> Sure, I can't even say mm-hmm. that. Um, then you, a lot of your opportunities are coming from Michelle on Facebook. Like, uh, I remember Derek talking about this, where this was after, like, okay, CD Baby made it big, and now he's in the business world, and there's other people that want to be like, hey, can you add this thing to your website? Or, like, do you want to partner with us and do this thing with your website? And actually, he had, like, this, he has this funny story I recommend about, like, um, people that kept wanting to make CD Baby, as he says, big, big, big. And he would answer all of those with, no, actually, I want to make my company smaller. So, like, <laughs> goodbye. Hangs up the phone. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, it's, it's a little bit too big already. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's, yeah, that, that you got to pay attention, I guess, to that feeling of being overwhelmed. And especially with, like, unexciting opportunities or... Um, I like the way that Draco put it to Harry in Methods of Rationality, that if you let those people um, take up all of your time... But you have to decide beforehand who you want to say, um, who you want to take up your time and not, because if you don't, then the people who are most pushy will take up all of your time. And that's usually not optimal. Mm -hmm. And he didn't say those exact words, but, you know, as the rich son of one of the most powerful people in the wizarding world, that was a problem he was used to running a lot into, whereas Harry had just been living under a cupboard. So (laughs) (laughs) 
think he, he didn't wasn't. know he needed those skills yet. He had good parents. That's true. He wasn't in methods of rationality. Yeah. But metaphorically, he, right he was. Yeah. Yes, there we go. Under a wizarding cupboard, at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like this one a lot, and I still think that I've had trouble incorporating it. Um, when, Stephen, you were saying, I don't know if I need to change my strategy yet, I think that's actually something that I want to dig more into. How do you know? Like, because success means different things to different people, and I don't even know what yeah. I would define success for me as. Like, I have some ideas, like, but I'd need to explore it. I'm right. pivoting a bit more into saying yes to a lot of things lately because now that I have uh, quit my day job, oh, which is a thing I oh, guess I'll talk about. Yeah. But now that I've quit my day job, I have some more time. And so I can be a little bit more, you know, open to picking up other things as well. Can I give Man, a shout congratulations. out? For, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You, you deserve a, a congrats for that. And then you, you mentioned um, in the pre, re, like we didn't record, we weren't recording it on Tuesday, that Tuesday was actually your last day and it was going to be Friday. Because you had yes. like some new manager who was trying to give yeah. you some some bullshit stuff or whatever, and you're like, you know what? I've taken three days PTO, and yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that is just I, that I is the most know. baller move ever. Of like, you know, you, two weeks is a courtesy. You know, keep in mind that your job won't give you two weeks if you're going to get fired. So like, I gave them four weeks actually. Yeah, so you're a hero already for going above and beyond. But like, I always try to remind people because a lot of jobs even ask like, well, give us a month's notice, and it's like, yes, if if you guys treat me well <laughs> and I and I have the opportunity, I will. But, yeah. you know, you guys won't give me on notice if you guys decide it's t time for you guys to cut me. So just keep in mind that anyway, I, I just liked how <laughs> you were like the whole reason that you wanted to stop working for the man was to stop taking shit. And you're like, oh, they're trying to make me take shit. You know what? Fuck this. And just that, that was awesome. <laughs> I mean, that, what, that is downright what kind, inspiring. Of what kind of leverage did he possibly think he had over me? <laughs> I was quitting in three days. What is going to fire me? I was like, fuck it. I'm done. <laughs> I just realized, I think I missed that part of the, when I was listening, uh, that you're saying you're, the last few days that you're going to be on, supposedly on the job you're taking as PTO. Yeah. That's so good. Well, I mean, th there's there's really no difference between quit quitting immediately or taking the next three days as PTO because they have to pay out all your PTO to you anyway under Colorado law. So it, it was effectively the same thing. It's a nice little flex, I guess. Yeah. Like it reminds me when I, I don't know, I started working at 14 and then like I switched jobs every year because it was interchangeable bullshit, like minimum wage jobs a kid could have. But it was always so satisfying to have the goal of I'm going to become the best person here and they're all going to rely on me. And then I'm going to walk out during their moment of greatest need. <laughs> during the nice. summer rush, I'm going to be like, well, I quit. Here's your uniform. <laughs> can't do anything yeah. about it. You can't That's stop right. me. I think I think why I like it so much is because it's it's so seldom that you get an opportunity to like your boss says do this and you get to say no and just leave. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what what a note to end your uh, your I, I guess career, but your um your your my tenure at that company. Well, your tenure at the company and your 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 time working a nine to five, right? Ah, like yeah. what, what a cool beat to end that on. Of like, no, I'm actually oh, just taking you. it fully into my hands. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway yeah, it was great yeah uh all right yeah there's only two here the second one was keep momentum yeah so you guys have to both pick different ones than the one i picked <laughs> <laughs> uh, well in that case i pick keep momentum <laughs> so the temptation is to take it easy but like swinging on jungle vines which is a link to tarzan <laughs> if you stop that forward motion you can never get it back um I don't know about never, but like in my experience, yeah, it's pretty hard to fall behind in just friendships, dating, jobs, like all the all the things that humans are trying to do. Um, I don't know. I don't have really strong opinions one way or the other about this one, I realize, because it's so short that it never really stuck with me. So I'm curious what you all think. I, I thought about that as it applies to me personally, because like I have quit my day job and you know, the thing is, he was saying, like, don't quit your job until you have the next one already in hand. Uh, that, that was the swinging vines metaphor. And, like, I'm thinking, does, does it count like I have my next job already in hand? Because I've had a number of short stories published in professional venues. I I won one of the most prestigious amateur short story award, awards. I, I published a book, but, like, I didn't get an agent and publish it through a publisher. I published it myself. So am I established enough that i can switch to this or should i keep writing while i'm trying to do accounting and podcasts and other stuff at the same time and 
I don't know. I don't know if he would have advised me to to actually quit my job when I did or not. But on the other hand, it, it does free up a lot of time. I have a whole lot in savings to ride out for quite a while. And like, honestly, I got, you know, a little bit of money coming in from the podcasts. Uh, I have a little bit of money coming in from the the properties I, I, I you know, rent out. And if I can, like, just write for the next five years, maybe I'll get some income coming in from the writing. And over that time, the proportion that the the rental properties bring in should hopefully go up. And I, I think I might not have to get back to accounting ever again. And that is my goal. And I think it was probably a good time to swing, even if maybe it was just a <laughs> tiny bit premature. But at some point, you got to just let go and leap, right? You can't be stuck by thinking, oh, this isn't the right time. This isn't the right time forever. Just be swinging back and forth, back and forth. The vine's yeah, going to get exactly. weaker. It's going to snap. It's going to get... Yep jungle rot I'll, I don't know if I can yeah. <laughs> I'll be replaced by fancy new accounting AIs a new vine might grow I don't know yeah. to fully torture that metaphor actually maybe to use it I mean so the idea was like <laughs> you know you don't he doesn't let go of the previous vine until he can confirm that the next one's holding his weight and yet you can't really confirm that it holds all your weight until you let go of the previous one yeah you know? that's true so there is a bit of a leap of faith, of faith involved so um yeah. and you know it's not like I don't know I there's not a good analogy for it, but it, it, it's not like you forsook any opportunity f- to ever work again. You know, you didn't burn your birth certificate, passport and driver's license and, <laughs> right. uh, you know, just vanish, you know? So like you're, you, if you're like, ah, you know, I need, I need a job. You, you can go get one. So there, there is going back. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> well, shall we move on to the last one? How to stop being rich and happy? Yes. Yeah. Before we get into the, the numbers on this, why would you want to do this? It's basically an opposite advice thing. Yeah, it's these, like, are, these are things, yeah. You, you do these pump. if you want to stop being rich and happy, so don't do these. Okay, I was just making sure because he doesn't caveat that. I guess he shouldn't have to. Maybe if I was smarter or didn't read these all in a flurry, I might have caught that. But I'm like, I, I'm reading this and I'm like, why would why would you want these things? I, yeah, so I guess, yeah, it's anti-advice. Yeah. Okay. It, it is funny because they almost sound like good advice. Well, they're good advice if you want to stop being rich and happy, apparently. Yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's why it's under this subheading. So like you think, oh, this sounds like good advice, but apparently it's awful bad advice. So I'll remember not to do those things. Yeah, I think all of this uh like it's important to keep in mind that Derek is sort of this troll who likes to just have a strong opinion about a thing in order to generate discussion around it. So that's probably the only reason right? it's like, do this, do this, do this, do this. And then number six is like, ah, don't do these things, but it's like snuck in there. Mm-hmm. I think some of these are meant to, or, or I don't know if they're meant to, but like all six well, of, some of one of these categories will sort of like resonate with me. Like, yeah, that one. Yeah. that, And then like one of them will be like, wait, what? And that's usually the one that like is the most interesting or important to mull over. Yeah. I think because like you know, what- on your back foot or something. Yeah, in a lot of the previous ones, there have been like, oh, yeah, we already do that thing. That's great. I'm glad, you know, that I'm affirmed. But, like, when you read through this one, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I do that thing. And they're like, oh, shit. Oh. <laughs> okay, it's not doing that thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um... so yeah, how to stop being rich and happy. Number one, prioritize lifestyle design. Number two, chase that comparison moment. Number three, buy, not rent. Number four, internalize your new status. <laughs> Number five, be a connoisseur. Number six, get to know your possessions. And number seven, acclimate to comfort. I want to say that number one, prioritize lifestyle design is a direct dig at Tim Ferriss, which was hilarious. Oh, really? He's been on his podcast a few times. I loved all the interviews. I really recommend them. I could stick links to those in there too. But um, mm. Tim Ferriss basically wrote the book on lifestyle design. I think he might have even coined the phrase with uh, the four hour work week. And this asshole comes on there and is just like, hi, I'm going to talk about my opinions and how they're directly against the things that you've said in your books and advocate for it. He's like, cool, let's do it. And they have these great nice. series of conversations where they're very amicably disagreeing with each other like this. I, I get so much yeah. value out of this sort of thing. Cool. <laughs> and yeah, this was a, you... a little bit like sort of nudge, nudge, wink. <laughs> so is number one the one you want to talk about then? I may as well since I've already started to. Uh, you've made it. So it's all about you now. Make your dreams come true. Shape your surroundings to please your every desire. Make your immediate gratification the most important thing. So I can see why that last one is a bad thing, but like, why why are those first two bad? So the idea behind lifestyle design 
was actually, you know, the four hour work week was about, it, 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 Tim Ferriss actually hates the title now and was like, ah, it was this marketing thing. I hate the tone that I did in that book. I was really anxious. So I put on this bro tone or whatever. Actually, it's a book about how to work really fucking hard in order to work less. Uh, yeah. So like it was come up with a bunch of side hustles, you know, like it, it's smart, like advice about how to become rich and then stop working and automate your income streams and then go do whatever the fuck it is you want to do. Travel the world, become a musician, uh, make like tiny food for hamsters on YouTube. I don't fucking know. <laughs> but um, the first half of the book was how to do that. And then the second half of the book was how to enjoy it. And it's interesting because this was Tim's first book and I've been following him for a while and he's changed his mind about a lot of this stuff too. But at the time it felt like there was that now you've freed yourself from the nine to five. Now the rest of your time can be all about traveling the world, seeking like exotic cuisines, uh, you know, like getting the perfect apartment or whatever the hell it is. It, it is very like self-centered and I think it's, there's something to be said for hedonism to an extent, but like uh, a lot of psych studies have shown that that's not really fulfilling for most people. It's probably really great for like a few years, maybe decades after you get out of like a really grueling job and never had the time to focus on you. This also seems directly to counter the idea of um, being able to plan, like, you know, own as little as possible is the opposite of shape your surroundings to please every desire, right? Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. It's sort of like, a, I don't know, I have two different sets of rich relatives and one set does actually like travel the world, but like, I don't know, they haven't made it their identity or they're like, they're, they're not stressing out about it. Whereas the other set of relatives, like, they always seem unhappy. And like, it's like, oh, we got to like throw this party for Martha Stewart or whatever. And <laughs> and it's, they're not like, I don't know. It seems like they should be doing things that are fun, like going on cruises or managing a bunch of different properties they own. But it like, it's like they've replaced the stress of the nine to five with the stress of having to manage a bunch of other things that like, mm, yeah. it's like, it feels like sort of a society says these like status things are what make me happy and worthwhile, but uh, it doesn't seem to, I don't know, maybe some people that's all they need, but yeah. it seems like most humans actually get a lot more value out of gratitude and service to others and, <laughs> and yeah. not like, you know, holding themselves up to some kind of standard that's unreachable. Or maybe it's just me. Well, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, I, I think, I think you're right. And yeah, I, I wasn't sure what that lifestyle design thing meant exactly, but you have cleared things up significantly. Steven, would you have one? Um, so if I'm picking like my favorite, uh, you know, bad advice, I think chase that comparison moment. This is like, if you wanted to write a book on how to not be a Buddhist. Uh, so it's, <laughs> <laughs> the, it's, the, the instructions are short. You have the old thing. You want the new thing. Yes, do it. Be happy for a week. Ignore the, Jump on that hedonic treadmill. That's right. Ignore the fact that, that happiness that. only comes from the moment of comparison between old and new. Once you've had a new thing for a week and it becomes the new norm, seek happiness from another new thing. Yeah. God, that sounds like a nightmare. I do want to say that I realized that I snarkily said, you know, if you want to go, like, make tiny food for hamsters on YouTube or whatever... I actually like I enjoy that a lot. So if you do want to do that, like go for it. <laughs> my, my wife shows me an Instagram that she follows. I think it's Toby the Toad, and she the her owner makes like little like uh, business stands, little hats, little yes. furniture for him. It's really really cute. So I actually don't think that falls under lifestyle design. I think that falls under doing whatever the fuck you want. Like uh, the actual definition of cool that I figured out. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. In retrospect. Or- I like the belatedly. I like the I like the be a connoisseur one. I I have been told, and I I think this is correct. Never ever develop taste in something that's expensive if you have to develop <laughs> taste in it. Like I like the fact that I enjoy um, cheap alcohols because if I were one of those people, I was like, well, I can never drink anything less than the hundred dollar brandy. Then when could I ever drink? It would be awful. And so yeah, d- definitely don't don't you know. Fi- rarify your tastes in things that are important and that you have to spend a lot of money on. I think I don't know. I, on the one hand, I kind of like rarifying my tastes in um in well, uh, maybe this is um this is a self serving bias because I've already done it. But in in things like uh, fiction, because it doesn't cost any more to read a really good book than it costs to read a really bad book, right? But it, on the other hand, it also limits a whole lot which books I can actually read and enjoy. Where 
a, you know, it used to be in the past, you could read anything. But that's just like the thing with kids. Like, we watched the crappiest cartoons and thought they were great. And how do you not look at them now as adult and be like, yeah, that's that's crap. I, I just had no taste as a kid. I think that's the, uh, what is the phrase? Letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Like, mm-hmm. there's a difference between, I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm a, like, beer snob and a coffee snob. But the thing is that I will still drink cheap beer or coffee or tea for Mm -hmm. that matter i really enjoy the nice ones but like i'll still drink a lipton tea if that's like what they have at my hotel or whatever and i'm like yeah it's tea it's all right you know like yeah i think the distinction there is not like don't have taste in anything it's don't like (laughs) i I guess i use the word snob but like don't become a snob uh don't you know let i'm just gonna end up repeating like a synonym for don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good so i'm just gonna stop there (laughs) <laughs> yeah no, i like it I, I do think it's it's nice to have to like appreciate things on a deeper level and really find the cool nuanced stuff but it is also nice if you can still continue to enjoy you know like silly 80s action movies like uh road warrior yeah despite the fact that you are also you know a highfalutin person who understands all the intricacies of nolan's latest movie ha <laughs> i yeah I, i'm the guy who still really likes watching american dad so um, cool. <laughs> I maintain that, th- that Seth MacFarlane's a genius and there's a reason he's had shows on like for a combined 30 something years because he's actually really smart and it's really funny, but that's a, that's a hill to die on another day. Um, I wanted to ask you guys Did about we... number three. Yeah. I wanted to bring that up too. Cause are, are you personally push- attacked or is he wrong here? I mean, so his point here is that, um, when you buy, it's not about the thing, it's about identity. This shows who you are now. It's basically like you are internalizing a thing as a, uh, a symbol, extension of yourself, a status symbol. So if you lose it, that sucks. You now have a vested interest in defending your brand or whatever. And uh, if some calamity strikes and you lose your boat, then that's a big personal loss and that sucks. So it seems to be more of a... a um, directive to not get too attached to your things and renting really helps with that uh renting can also be like good advice in general he he mentioned in one of his earlier directives uh that renting buys you opportunity you can move from one location to another very easily all you got to do is wait out uh the the current lease or you know even break it and pay a minor minor penalty whereas once you've like owned a house you are deeply invested in the 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 shape of the neighborhood the things not getting worse um which i mean can be good as well but there's there's a lot of things that come with um buying uh you now have to maintain it yourself rather than you know relying on whoever actually owns the place to maintain it you got to care about whether the thing gets damaged um so renting has a lot of benefits to it but on the other hand if you buy and the asset appreciates that's that's a, a boon too, which is why I never think it's necessarily a bad idea to buy real estate. Um, yeah. It can be like it's one of those things that's really. It depends on the time. It depends on the location. It depends on a lot of things um, in in your life. Sometimes it really is better to rent, but other times buying can have you know big benefits to it as well. To be clear, I, I should like... have I should have emphasized number three was buy, not rent. Yes. Yeah. I feel like this is not meant to be taken as financial advice, but more generally. Um, I know, because I've read more of Derek's stuff, that one of the things he advocates is living your life as a series of experiments. Like, okay, this month I live in Melbourne, Sydney in a small apartment, and then this next month uh, I live in like farmland in a small house, and I own a car, and then this next month I'm backpacking across the whatever. Like, so... I think it's more like just a restatement of sort of the walk away principle. It's not necessarily don't own things. It's just like, don't let things own you. Don't like get Mm. to a place in your life where, for example, Annie Ash, if you got some kind of awesome opportunity to move to Stockholm and become like some kind of superstar writer, which would be cool. Mm. uh, Yeah. You could just sell your properties here and leave. If you got like, yeah. I think the the thing that would be problematic there is, oh no, I can't take this offer up because I'm already really invested in what I've got going on here. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it, it it's it's more of a thing for like more incremental advances. Like Stephen, if your new job, if like, you've got another offer that were they, they were willing to pay like forty. 50 percent more but your new job was in fort collins well you probably want to jump on that but you're also like now commuting 
that fucking hour, hour and a half every day until you can sell this place, buy a new place, and then all the transaction costs of that. It's it, it does make you less nimble. So yeah, yeah, that's a good point. There, there's a trade offs to be made there. I think Jace would have phrased. I think I think your phrasing for number three was better than what Derek did. Like instead of buy not rent, I might I I might have called it like let your stuff own you. Um, mm. Cause that, that's, yeah. that's more of a, I, I think you hit it more on the head of like why it's a problem. You know, renting has advantages this... for certain things, but buying makes a lot of sense. Like just, just one quick stupid anecdote. Like my first apartment, we were there for four years and I just kind of forgot that with my internet bill, I was renting my, my router and modem, I think for like mm-hmm. a combined, like 16 bucks a month or something. And how long did that go on for? Four years. <laughs> oh. it, was, it wasn't until like we were moving out of there that I realized like, what the fuck? I wasted hundreds of dollars, you know, if Dang. I just, you know, re- well, I mean, you know, it is what it is, but, and no, it could have been like a, a more understandable. Yeah. It, it could have, you know, it could have been more money. It could have been a bigger deal, but it was just like, at that point I could have just gone to Best Buy, bought a thing for the cost of, I don't know, a few months worth of renting one from Comcast. And then a, I get to bring it with me and B it, I don't pay for it every month. It was just like, uh, I mean that, but that's not the spirit of this, this bullet point here. You know, I didn't, I don't, yeah. I don't even care what brand of crap i have like as long as it works for the router and stuff right it's just and using using this phrasing also makes it a lot more um like it sticks in your head because it's very counterintuitive it's like you suddenly pay attention to that you're like what really <laughs> yeah uh, you know it is interesting though like we were talking earlier about cd baby and what are cds uh nowadays there is a lot of basically renting of media through streaming services like Spotify and Netflix and stuff rather than buying it and having it forever, but then also having to move it and having it take up space in your living uh, area. And, and there's, you know, that's one of the trade-offs. You don't have to worry about it getting damaged. You don't have to find a place to hold it at all times. I've also been able to cycle, you know, talking about media between Spotify versus YouTube music versus whatever, uh, lately, like, I'm paying for a subscription to Disney Plus and getting a lot of value out of that. I canceled my Netflix. Uh, you yeah, have more options and you can more quickly switch to a thing that's better serving you. And it yeah. promotes competition in the industry. As long as we're on that, this actually does tie in vaguely enough for me to rant for a second um, about owning physical things, and having them take up space and Disney Plus. So uh, <laughs> over the pandemic, Rachel and I watched The Mandalorian, which if you're not a Star Wars person, that's fine. This is just an awesome series of like short. It's like it's like two Western movies or like one long Western movie in the Star Wars universe. You don't need to know a thing about Star Wars to have a have a great time. Maybe the more Star Wars, you know, the more like little fun things you can have. But it's a perfectly standalone thing. And as I'm watching this, I'm like, oh, this is the perfect gift for my dad. Like he's a, a moderate Star Wars fan. I'm sure he enjoyed the ones you know that came out in the 70s. And he's a big the good ones. And he's a big Western fan. And so. Uh, I was just last night looking up how to buy, I was going to buy Blu-rays. There are no Blu-rays of the Mandalorian. What you can find on Amazon are pirated uh, copies that are sold that look semi-authentic, but Disney is spelled about an S and uh, (laughs) the, the the reviews on them are like, these are clearly not even good rips. These are just like, uh, you know, poor quality um, bootlegs. So the annoying thing is like, my dad has a Blu-ray player. He would love to have the Blu-rays of the Mandalorian, but Disney has decided that it's not worth making physical things for this, for us to give our, you know, uh, our, our boomer parents who don't like, you know, having to use their remote to go to the app on the TV to find the thing. Like, so what I'm going to do instead is I will, I will get them a Disney plus subscription and go to their house and set it up on their, on their, on their television, no. <laughs> um, which will actually probably cost less than, than Blu-rays if I only give them like a year. But it Probably just seems will. silly. So what the, you know, I get, you know, the, it's nice to not have to move with stuff or whatever, but how are they, they so they're not selling Loki, WandaVision or anything on DVD or disc. Huh. They probably yeah. will eventually in some kind of form. I don't know if it'll be on disc, but. I mean, it just seems like the kind of thing that, I mean, I, they, they know what they're doing. They're going to make money, but I just needed to rant about that for a second because like one of my, <laughs> my old man yells at clouds things is like. I'm trying to give you money. Like, yeah. let me buy it. And they and there's no way to do it. Or, mm-hmm. or like the website makes it annoying or something or whatever. Like, 
it's just like this is just bad for you guys i'm trying to buy this thing now what i'm mm-hmm. tempted to do is just give him my stolen copies on a i think on a they're flash doing drive. pretty well and, for themselves actually <laughs> no disney's doing great but like in general like there, there are websites where like you know the 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 checkout process is annoying or something. And it's like, you know what? It's not worth the trouble. I'm not making a profile on your website to buy stickers or whatever shit. Right. Like, yeah. so, is that a thing? so yeah, so, some things are just not worth the trouble of like, okay, yeah, I'm not spending 10 minutes doing this. This was a 30 second operation. Um, anyway. Yeah. My, that's my soapbox of make it easy for people to spend money on your stuff. If you're going to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> and, and speaking it of making it easy for people to spend money on our stuff, we have a merch store where you can spend money on our stuff. Oh, That's yeah. right. Which is basically our logo slapped on a bunch of things if you would like to buy them. And also we have a Patreon where you can donate to us, which um, we really appreciate because it makes us feel like, you know, we, we matter to you. Um, I, I know it f- sounds really stupid when put that way, but like it really it really feels warm to like look at that number and see this many people think that we're actually valuable enough in their lives that they're willing to give a buck or two uh, per episode. And, and it makes me feel good. Plus it makes me feel extra good now that I don't have a steady income. <laughs> so. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah. And if you, uh, if you don't have the um, expendable income or, or, you know, if, if Patreon sucks and you, you don't want to deal with it or whatever, uh, you know, votes on um, the podcast, store of your choice that don't say this show sucks are always appreciated yes <laughs> the more stars the more we appreciate it yes uh do we have more to say on this before we wrap it up for the day that it's a really short a read point. everyone should go through and read these they're just fun yeah, yeah it's a few sentences each too and if you want to dig deeper you can there's links to his longer blog posts about these things i actually clicked on the one i was like Okay, I got to know what the hell is the one Tarzan. I don't think I'd seen that. And there's just like a slightly longer but not super long article and a cool animated gif of Tarzan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, that's and all he's I got. got like a long list of a whole bunch of other articles he's written. If you want to go over those and reviews of the, the books, it's just it's a lot of good stuff in here. Yeah, I'll stick some of uh, I'll, I'll stick some links to his interviews on the same fair show. And he has a book out. Oh, he has several books out too that are also good. I don't know. Um, I feel like maybe just linking to his site though, <laughs> and the podcast episodes is probably good. Yeah, you can find all the rest of the stuff. Yeah, check the show notes for stuff. And as you mentioned, uh, the thank the patron section today. Uh, big special shout out to James Goodther. You rock. You give us all those warm fuzzies that Enosh described, and I hope you had fun listening to this episode. Um, yeah, this this one. You know, we, we we are coming down from like a few episodes of like talking about things that are uh, like society's doing this wrong or this this thing's annoying. More back to our old format of like, here's a neat thing. Let's talk about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, you know, not to say we'll never have uh, yells at clouds episodes, but um, I, was, <laughs> right. I was smiling the whole time and I had a good time with this one. So thanks yeah. again, James. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All righty. Well, uh, we will see everybody again in two weeks. Thanks for joining us and peace out. Sounds Bye, good. Bye, everybody.